Good. All right, I'd like to call us to order. Welcome everyone, good to see you all. Welcome to our June 2022 Central School District Board of Directors meeting. I'd like to start with uh, the flag salute. Darcy, would you mind leading us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, let's do the adoption of the agenda. Superintendent, would you please review the agenda? Yes, we will start with communication from the floor and then go into our standing reports. We have uh, one report from Central uh, Education Association from Talmadge Middle School. We will then go into uh, several reports, one specific to our uh, data, English language proficiency, attendance, and our uh, snapshot of our third uh, installment of our universal screener specific for reading. We will have an update uh, as we, we've worked through this country through some difficult times and uh, Director Clark is here to talk about safety and security. We have an update in nutrition services. Again, we'll go into the superintendent report or we do have one policy under first reading and some other information I will share with the board tonight uh, into the, excuse me, then to the board report for you all to share information to our consent agenda and then several business agenda items uh, that we will work through, uh, several of which we will um, ask for votes this evening and then conclude into uh, comments by the board any actions for future items, and then we will go into executive session to end the evening. Great, thank you. Any questions about the agenda? All right, let's go on to communication from the floor. Comments from the community are entertained during the time designated under communications public comments. If you wish to speak to the board, please fill out a comment card online or in person and turn into the board secretary, board chair at the beginning of the meeting. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to do that. Speaker comments in our board meetings are limited to three minutes, but the board welcomes additional information in writing. Personnel laws prohibit the board from hearing public complaints about an individual in an open meeting. All complaints uh, must go through the board's approved process as outlined in board policy KL. This form may be found at our website or by calling the district office. Typically a speaker's comment is taken under advisement to allow time for the board to review an issue. However, the board chair or other board members may ask a speaker for additional information or may convene the, uh, may convey to the speaker some information that addresses their comment. Please note on the speaker card if you would like to receive follow-up communication and if so, what avenue is preferred. Uh, given our situation with the high school principal hiring, I just wanna reiterate that we don't talk personnel in our public comments. There's a reason for that. It's in contracts, it's in policy that we just avoid those, any of those type of public comments because of the confidentiality that everyone deserves and is expected. So if we get into that tonight, I will stop you and ask that we not do that and stick to any procedural or process concerns that you might be wanting to express, but we will not be talking anything related to specific personnel. That being said, Steve, uh, just to clarify a little more, you're talking about names in general. Not names specific, specific yes. Yeah. Specific feedback, complaints, or affirmation, either way. Um, and I double checked with our attorney on this point and also reread the policy. So it's just safe to avoid that in its entirety. I just so. wanted to clarify names. Yep. Okay, with that, our first speaker is Joel Everett. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be the test case on right here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Joel Everett. I come here as a community member 
as a teacher, as a coach, as uh, a father to two boys that are be coming through this system uh, next year, actually. Um, I want to tell you, I, I was not born in this area, but I came here about 12 years ago uh, and I was taught what it was to be a Panther. Uh, Panther, I was taught uh, this, this, uh, this meaning by people like Sylvia Warren, uh, Shane Hedrick, Mike Ainsworth, Tom Poff, Van Holstad, Dan Hansen, Keith and Allison Omlid, the Mendozona family, the McDonald's, the Watkins, and Rosanna Larson. These people provided stability to our community high school, and they taught me the values of this community, and I thank them all for that. Stability, stability is vital to our community high school, and that stability um, was shown in how this group, this community has battled through COVID and through the loss of, uh, of Panthers recently. But the key piece uh, of this is that many of these Panthers are still here and very much care about this community. Uh, the high school right now does not have much trust in, in, in our above leadership. I don't say everyone, I can only speak for the majority that I think is here. That trust is usually earned, we gave it, we feel that we've been burned with it. Um, it's been clear that there's power to assign or who is the key decision in these things. I'll try to stay away from that like I've been asked. Um, board members who were at the meeting last Wednesday, thank you very much. I think you saw the damage and the pain that's going on at our high school right now. And I hope in the executive sessions, you guys were able to share that with the others who were not there. Um, we're facing an admin crisis at the high school right now. That stability that we so long for, that we so cherish, is on the verge of collapse. There will be those that stay behind and try to pick up things and move on like we always do. But it's not so easy when more and more Panthers keep walking out the door or forced out the door. Um, we all know we can't talk about the reasons of things, but it's a pretty big elephant when it's not enough to, make it to fire, but it's not enough to hire. That stability we feel is going out the door and the high school is not better off for it. And we don't believe this community is better off for it. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Jillian Macbeth. I don't see her. Was she in person or going to be online? <laughs> okay. Uh, Lori Zmanski. Good evening, school board members, Dr. Kapista, community members, teachers, and staff. My name is Lori Shemansky. I've been a teacher at Central High School for 24 years. I'm also a parent in this district. After commuting for, from Salem for 16 years to this job, I've moved my own children from Salem to 13J so that they could be Panthers. I have sacrificed much of my life and time for this district for the last quarter of a century, so I hope that you will take just a tiny bit more than three minutes tonight to listen to me. I come before you today to share my frustration with the process of hiring administration in this district, and I want to share with you all what it has done collectively to the staff of Central High. I speak for myself and on behalf of a large majority of staff at CHS. First, I can assure you that despite our frustration, we're all professionals and continue to do our jobs to the best of our ability. But our best right now isn't what we're capable of because of the hardship we are enduring due to the choice to reopen the principal position. Last week, Dr. Kabista came to our staff meeting. We we're grateful she was willing to set aside her agenda for us. However, though she appeared to listen, she offered no clarity, no compassion, no true acknowledgement for harm done, despite the many tear-stained faces in the room. After sharing our stories, we collectively left feeling that meeting more unvalued, unheard, and with a name for how we felt, grief. 
This is not whining. We are collectively grieving, not just from the upheaval of the difficulty of the last two years of reinventing everything due to COVID, but true grief of losing Van, Dan, and Maynard, who each lapped behind massive holes in the Panther family that we are all desperately trying to fill. And now when we were so hopeful that one of our very own would lead us, we are grieving the potential loss of her leadership as well. It is unfathomable to us why you think our preferred candidate is the wrong choice when it is so obvious to us and the community that she has the right choice. It is even made harder when you have not been clear about why she isn't. We have no trust in the process anymore. Indeed, there is no meaningful process if at the end the superintendent gets to tap whomever they wish and make their own choice. We want the community to know that the staff at CHS are now also living with the fear that we will have at least one new administrator, at most three, who will potentially come in and shake everything up. Big city outside voices are not better than our small town voices and the people who actually live here. In my 25 years in education, I have seen new admin come in and try to change everything way too many times. It never turns out well. It takes years to fix and entire cohorts of students feel the sting. The career hopping captain will eventually jump ship and the teachers and staff and students are left floating in the wake and have to figure out how to get everything back on course. At this point, we don't even know how that is possible to avoid, since many of my colleagues are now looking for work elsewhere, applying for jobs outside Central, talking about moving their families. We stand to be gutted as a school, and I am heartbroken for the Panther family when this could have so easily been avoided. What do we want? We want to be heard and valued in the process. We also want a leader who will not jam their own oar into the water and drastically steer us into some other direction and simply say, trust me. We need consistency. We need equity and social emotional support that is just that is not just in writing, but in practice from all our leaders. Please understand that I am one voice, but I represent many. We have yet to feel heard or acknowledged despite so many efforts. Actions speak louder than words, and it's been made clear to us where we stand. This has caused a broken relationship between the DO and the building, and it's up to you all if you would like to restore the relationship or continue to grow the wedge between us. I hope for the sake of the community and all our teachers and staff and students that you choose restoration. Thank you for listening to my entire message. Jane Elliott. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jane Elliott. I'm a teacher and one of the restorative practice facilitators for Central High School Community. Although this is not a restorative meeting, some staff members have asked me to bring that lens to this discussion. First, I must address our shared need for safety and security. I understand that members of the board and the district office have received threatening and violent messages in response to the last hiring process. One member experienced a physical threat when a student threw rocks at her. As a teacher, I wanna offer my active support in resolving this harm. This behavior makes everyone unsafe, and we hope that we can engage in a community-wide effort to repair the harm done. Second, I wanna thank you, Dr. Kubista and the board members present at the Wednesday morning meeting at CHS. In our last meeting, I shared that people who have been harmed have an inventory of needs that must be met, including safety and security, information, truth-telling, empowerment, and restitution or vindication. Dr. Kubista, your willingness to change your agenda and listen to the impact of the previous hiring process allowed our staff to tell the truth about our experiences. By opening this dialogue at a community level, we found within our CHS Panther community a sense of connectedness. We are here today because we wanna find stability for our community and move forward with the best possible leadership for the Panther family. The question is how will we restore a sense of empowerment to those who feel fearful, unheard, bereaved, confused, insecure, angry, and betrayed. You asked staff what characteristics, skills, and qualities we were looking for in the next principal. The problem is that a significant percentage of your stakeholders feel that the person who meets the criteria is already in our community. We want someone who grew up here. We want someone who sent their children to school here. We want someone who was teacher of the year. 
We want someone who founded our Power Peers Juntos Ninth Grade on Track and Restorative Practice programs. We want someone who has a deep connection to countless community members. We want someone who our families, our students, our classified and certified staff, and the Wu faculty knows, trusts, and respects. And all of these people have recently had too many other losses to count. Many of us are here tonight because the last hiring process harmed our dear friend. We do not have answers as to why this happened. We do not feel our voices have been heard, so we do not have a sense of control, nor do we feel confident that this will not happen again. One thing that I ask from everyone tonight is that we all practice the kind of repair that listens without judgment, that takes accountability for choices that have been made, and allows solutions to arise from the collective voice. I would also like to ask that you, Dr. Cubista, and the district office hire an external restorative facilitator to guide us as we continue this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Frank White. <clears throat> Can I add something real quick to that? To, to yours. Um, I didn't, I didn't go to the meeting, I didn't, I didn't get to go, but um, I did meet with the two that did and they gave us a pretty good uh, reflection on notes. I mean, notes upon notes upon notes upon notes on what was said. So I, uh, I appreciate the notes that were shared to us and what you all had to say and took note of that. Good evening. My name is Frank White. I teach history at Central High School. I want to thank you for providing time and space for me and others to voice our concerns regarding the hiring process for the new principal at the high school and its outcome. First off, I'd like to thank the members of the board who've had the courage and grace to respond to my communications and the communications of my colleagues. An open dialogue supports empathy, which is an essential component of establishing trust. You've heard a lot about the harm resulting from the process of choosing the next principal at the high school and the necessity of acknowledging that harm, <clears throat> the necessity of acknowledging that harm before reconciliation can begin. And the groundwork for establishing trust can finally be laid. I will add my voice to the broad spectrum of stakeholders who share these conclusions. In the wake of the significant loss, many gifted educators have begun looking for employment in other venues or even considered leaving the profession entirely. Many cite the failure of the district's leadership actions in this process, as well as the inconsistency in values between district leadership and the staff as motivations to take their considerable talents elsewhere. No doubt, we will lose some good people because of this error in judgment. For many of us, however, being a Panther is a way of life, one that transcends poor judgment and administrative incompetence. In the short time I've had the privilege of being a Panther, the high school has had several leaders and has moved in different directions depending on who was guiding us. We've become used to a spinning compass that offers little stability or consistency. We've had some gifted leaders, including our current outgoing principal. None has lasted very long. I will leave it to them to explain their own experiences. As for the staff at the high school, we have lost a tremendous opportunity because of this mistake. My colleagues have expressed their pain and disappointment more eloquently than I could. I think that for many of us, the result of this mistake will be not to quit, but to return, return to familiar ground, ground not of our choosing, but ground we have been forced to once again, hard ground. We will connect in our pain and disappointment, disappointed once again by district leadership that is either too disconnected from the needs of the high school or so disinterested in those needs as to reject the best con candidate to continue the inspiring work begin at the high school, in the district and in the community. Clearly something else matters more to district leadership than the wishes of the majority of the staff at the high school, more than a sizable contingent of this community, and more than the voices of students have expressed their alarm at the district's decision. I wonder if we will ever know what was more important than the anguish expressed by these stakeholders. I wonder whose voices carried more weight, whose wishes held more sway than these people. No, I don't believe ultimately that most of us will leave. Some have weathered many such storms in their time at Central. We will look to them for the leadership we need, for the mutual respect that binds us together as a learning community. As one of my colleagues recently said, 
Administrators come and go, superintendents come and go, board members come and go, we remain. A good point that, although the loss is devastating, we will continue to do what we do best, serve the needs of our students who look to us to provide the best learning environment possible. For those of you who have not worked in a classroom, it may be impossible to fully understand the camaraderie generated in these environments, what it means to work shoulder to shoulder with such talented people. For those of you who have worked in the classroom, no explanation is needed. You already know. I am proud to be among these gifted professionals, these dedicated people. I am fortunate to serve this community and these remarkable students, all of whom have been misserved by your process and your decision to support its result. Thank you. Amanda Lacer. Good evening. Um, my name is Amanda Leister, and I teach uh, Spanish at the high school. Uh, this is year 20 for me. And I'm I'm a very proud community member, and I'm really a proud member of Central High School and the teaching staff there. Um, this shoulder to shoulder statement Frank just made, I'm, I love that. Um, my words tonight are reflective of a very dear colleague, and they're reflective of many in our building. <sighs> many in our building have become frustrated by our district leadership not recognizing our need for consistency at this time and our building principal to take us forward. We are frustrated by our district leadership not seeing that we had a candidate that helped create, strengthen, and guide our current culture and successes. We are frustrated by our district leadership not having a vision that aligns with our needs. We are frustrated by our district leadership's view that a mistake wasn't made, that the harm we expressed isn't something to respond to with urgency, and that no apology is needed. Uh, many in our building are in fear that the damage the decision to continue for the search for a new principal will cause. Many of us fear uh, and question future decisions made by our district leadership as the needs they see we have and the needs our staff sees are not in alignment. Many of my colleagues and myself now question our commitment to this district because of the damage caused. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Lori and Brooks. Lori and Brooks. I hope that's I hope that's me. <laughs> All right. Greetings. My name is Lorian Brooks. I have been teaching for 15 years, the last seven of which have been in this district at Central High School. I'm sorry, I'm a little short. Um, so the last seven of which have been at, in this district at Central High School as a science teacher. The last six of the seven years, I have been the sponsor of the GSA Club. Uh, this club supports LGBTQIA students and their allies. I've also been a part of the district equity team and the CHS equity team. Due to these experiences, I know the importance of respect, dignity, and self-worth. Our students need to be able to know that they enter our schools and have support from top to bottom, administration to teachers to staff that they will receive respect from everyone when they enter our buildings, mm -hmm. that they will actively be protected from bullying, whether due to the color of their skin, their sexuality, or their gender orientation. I am concerned. I am concerned that highly qualified BIPOC staff are being passed over for white individuals with less years of experience. I am concerned that a VP administrative position was opened in the district and that that position was never posted, even internally. The position was instead appointed without any opportunity for any internal candidates to apply. And that appointment was given to a white candidate. I'm also concerned that at CHS, two individuals who are highly qualified made it to the final round. And then neither of those final candidates presented were chosen. CHS is left rudderless as we look into the next year. 
Other staff members have talked about the grief that we have been experiencing. Over the last 14 months, CHS has had three staff members die. Three. We have lost Van Holstead, Dan Hansen, and just this spring, we have also lost Maynard DeWitt. Our students have lost countless family members. We have students that are suffering the death of multiple staff members this year alone. Our high school is grieving. Our high school needs support, consistency, compassion, and courage as it moves into next year. We need a Panther. Thank you. Ben Hindstone. Uh, Mike Ainsworth. <laughs> It's kind of hard to follow all that because I am a Panther 49 years ago. And I'm extremely disappointed in what's happened with regards to the hiring of a principal here at Central High School. I just ask why neither of the finalists was chosen. Uh, if they were the final two, I would have expected one of them to be hired. Okay. And if neither one of them were qualified, then why did you put them forward? Uh, I went to the meet and greet um, and I talked to Jennifer for a little bit there. And uh, for us, as far as I was concerned, there was only one candidate that was viable and that would be uh, our current vice principal. Uh, the other gentleman, I would say, was not qualified and I don't know how he got through the process. I think that the school district needs to look at the new the process of hiring a principal and who these people were who were on the selection committee. Because if it was an HR person, I would question um, why they're in that position. Because the one person was not qualified at all, as far as I was concerned. I did my background check check these folks out, both of them. Uh, I'll, I will say that Rosanna was my number one choice. I, oh, I shouldn't say her name, sorry. You were gonna say that, weren't you? Yeah. 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 But anyway, um, here's, a, here's, a, here's an individual that has been a Panther her whole life. She went to school here. Her children went to school here. Her mother-in-law's family is the reason this is called Henry Hill. Whatever happened to hiring someone with a little bit of a legacy at our school district instead of bringing somebody in from outside? We found that that doesn't work and it ha it's not, I shouldn't say it's not gonna work, but I just don't know the decision-making and that's disappointing to me because I have better things to do with my time than to come to school board meeting and find this out because I have a vested interest, okay? My wife and I all both went to school here. Both of our children went to school here. My grandchildren are going to school here. And I would think that the leadership at the district office is lacking a lot, okay? I wanna know the experiment that the school board took when they hired the superintendent, Jennifer. Can I say her, I can't say her name? Go ahead. Okay, when they hired Jennifer, okay. I think it was uh, an experiment because she has never been in a building. So you're crossing the line, Mike. Okay. Because you're now singling out an individual. If there's a complaint about the superintendent, you can submit okay. a complaint to the board. Okay, I'll, like just say, I'll just say- I'll just say- In generalities. Okay. I would think that someone that's going to make a decision for a principal position or a vice principal position would have been a school teacher. 
that's always been the pecking order. You're a school teacher, then you get in the administrative part, you go to become a vice principal, and then the principal comes open, okay? And I would just wanna know why someone from our own district wasn't chosen. And I, and I know you can't tell me who was on the selection committee or how the process went, but the process is flawed. And the school district needs to look at that because there's no way you should have wasted my time and everyone else's time on the meet and greet. And you knew you were gonna hire either one of them. You surely weren't gonna hire one of the folks, okay? because of the litigation that precedes the, the gentleman. I can't say that? Okay, well, anyway. Anyway, I did my homework. I, think we have I did my homework, point. but I don't think the school district did their homework, okay? If I was an owner of a business and I had somebody running my corporation. So and, I, uh, I, I think we understand the point of the background checks. I think that that's something. No, that I don't we, think you do, Steve. Well, we I, have I don't think the school district has followed through that. Okay. And I, and I don't know why it's such a secret that they can't say who the folks were that were on that selection committee. Okay. Because I want to know, I want to know what knowledge they had to be able to select that position. Okay. And that's not the right wording, but you know what I mean? Those folks don't know what a principal is. Okay. But I know they were probably in Jennifer's in the superintendent's little group. And that's what I would expect that if I was a superintendent, I'd have my little group. But I'm here to question all of that. I'm to, here to question those decisions that have gone on here with this. Because number one, it's a waste of revenue from the school district. Have all these people go ahead and go through this. Highly paid people. We have people that are making a lot of money to make these decisions and they're not right. And what I'd really like to see is I would like to see the school board ask these same questions, but I don't know what they say in your private sessions, okay? But do you, do you guys really see that this was done right? The whole process, the whole process was not done correctly to get to this point, okay? We have a valuable vice principal that should be in this position. And it's just going to take longer and longer to do it. Mike, I think you're at time. So. Okay, but can I, I got one more word to say, thing to say. And what I really want to ask the school board is I would like for you guys to take a vote of no confidence. Because I think all these folks out here and hundreds, if not thousands in the community are fed up with the decision of what happened and the way our school district is, not, is going. I don't think like somebody said, there's not a rudder there, okay? We're going this way and that way. But I would ask the school board to vote for no confidence, move forward and look, start looking for a new superintendent, okay? You guys can do that. That's your opportunity to do it, to listen to all these people, all the emails that you've had. I mean, I'm a Panther, but I've never been so disappointed in the 49 years since I got out of high school of this decision and what's going on with the leadership of the school district. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Ben Gorman. Hi there. Um, my name is Benjamin Gorman. You all know me. Um, I wasn't going to speak today uh, because I wear a lot of different hats and that sometimes complicates things. And uh, uh, I want to be mindful of that. And so I'm not going to recommend any particular action uh, because uh, it, it gets tricky. What, uh, you know, which role is, is asking that of you. But I, there were a couple of things, concerns that I wanted to bring up that came about as a consequence of your last meeting and then our meeting with Dr. Cabista at the high school. Um, because they seemed to me to fly in the face of something that I am entrusted by you to teach our students. Um, one of those things is that I heard a lot at the last meeting references to your role 
uh, and not kind of micromanaging day-to-day -day operations. And I know that that is a message that comes through OSBA and COSA and the superintendent. Uh, and I think that I, I serve on a board myself. I understand where that comes from. I think that's appropriate most of the time. But when you are a board member, you should stay out of day-to-day -day operations when things are going well. And I hope that you are hearing from folks that things are not going well. And this is a time when it is appropriate for members of the board to engage and to assert yourselves when things are not going properly. The other thing that flies in the face, and, and the reason that flies in the face of, of what we teach our students is one of the things that I try and make sure my students feel is empowered in my classroom. Uh, they should not let somebody else tell them what their place is. And I feel like sometimes you are told this is your place. And so I encourage you to push back on that and decide for yourselves what is your place and not what is the OEA, OSBA or the superintendent tell you your place is tonight. The second thing that is uh, a, a bit of a challenge uh, for me is that I am entrusted by, by you and by this community to teach our students reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And any language arts teacher can tell you that measuring listening by itself is impossible. We can only know what our students are hearing based on what they do afterwards. And I'm very concerned that we will now sit here as audience members through the rest of this meeting. And at the end, we will be told, as we were at the last meeting, that we were heard. And in my class, that would get you an F. We need action. And so I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I think I, I want to convey to you that we need, you all have power tonight. Any one of you can make a motion, and then everyone else has to vote on it. And if you don't make a motion, tonight, please don't tell us that you heard us. Because telling us that you heard us without making a motion sends a very strong signal that you think everything's fine. If you heard the people who are speaking tonight, you will do something about it tonight. You'll make a motion based on what you heard, and you'll take a vote. And there were some ideas presented, and you could consider those. You could decide what you heard and what needs to be done. Um, but to say you heard someone and then not do anything is a failure of leadership. So please, someone, make a motion and take a vote. Thank you. Is that it? Uh, nope, one more. Amy Overland. Hi, this is my first time actually to a board meeting. Um, and my content does not is completely separate than everybody else's. Uh, so I'll make mine short. Um, sounds like we start off kind of with who we are. So I am a community member. I'm a parent of six in our district. Um, and I'm a new faculty or staff member as well, um, just completing my first year. Uh, but I have worked uh, in conjunction side by side with the district for about eight years in mental health and um, kids with disabilities in our community. Um, so my concern today that I just wanted to bring to the board to make sure that we have, um, again, my goal is transparency and clarification um, as a parent. Um, and so I've got four kids at Monmouth Elementary School and um, So there was new content um, put out for uh, Pride Month. And so I wanna start by saying that, um, and really thank the entire district um, and um, Dr. Kubista for being champions definitely in equity for all um, and continuing to make that push for empathy and making it a priority. Um, it's, it's a big personal priority of uh, myself and my work and with my family as well. Um, what happened at MES was um, there was new content put out um, regarding Pride Month um, by the equity team um, in the form of lessons sent to the teachers, um, but I was not not notified as a parent. Um, and the concern there was um, as I tried to just gather some additional information um, uh, for my kiddos because uh, uh, there was a varying, uh, I have a very, very big uh, varying age groups. And so I know age, age appropriateness is very important, um, especially for um, any content really. And so uh, making sure that they all had their needs met 
with that. So um, all four of our teachers, um, ranging from kindergarten to uh, fourth grade, all gave completely different explanations of um, what the content was. Um, they uh, lots of confusion, lots of uncomfortableness. They weren't sure how they were going to use it. Each were going to use it differently. Some were clearly not going to use it. Some were going to use it if they had time. Some were going to use it if they felt the need. Um, so a lot of questions there that um, I just thought, again, uh, consistency with any content would be important. You know, is this curriculum? Who approved it? Um, and again, what are the age appropriatenesses so that we can fit all of those um, kiddos across the board? Um, there was content uh, regarding relationships, sexuality, and gender identity, um, which again, I think is all important and in, in parts of our sex education, um, certainly, but I know that that's uh, always broken down by age and an important factor. Um, and so uh, ultimately, why is each uh, teacher deciding what is age appropriate or person appropriate? Is the board aware of the lessons? Who approved them? Uh, why weren't parents notified? Um, were children with disabilities given consideration? I do have a kiddo with a, um, a mental disability and his processing, again, content that I just definitely want to support him through, both before, after, and during. Um, and, and that goes for, again, being an employee and all of our kids in the community. Um, so just, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, is there someone who can get back? To yeah, well, we, we will do follow up with that. Yes, um, it'll either be myself or our executive director of teaching and learning. It won't be in this meeting. It will not. Can we put that on an agenda for maybe it's not a priority for it? Just of, of the content of follow up? Yeah. Yes. Is that it then? Yes, that is it for okay. public comment. So we will move on now to Sandy reports and programs. Do we have someone from CE8 with us tonight? Lucy and Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda Bergstead. I am a teacher and coach at Talmadge Middle School. I'm also one of our building reps. And I am Lucy Hunter. I'm a seventh grade math teacher and an AVID 7 teacher. And we're here to share some of the awesome things happening at Talmadge Middle School. Not everything, just the, some highlights. <laughs> <laughs> we could go to the next slide. There we go. Perfect. Um, so our eighth grade ELA classes are currently um, concluding a unit on telling their stories. And so they're finding their voices and um, learning to express themselves of different topics that have happened. And through that process, the teachers have found that some of the students are truly taking on journaling of their own to tell their stories. Um, one student who's been having a hard time with his memory has actually started to find some memories through this process. And students are being vulnerable and sharing just amazing things through their stories, both difficult and positive, but a great project they've been working on. Also in eighth grade uh, ELA, uh, they have receive some grant money and they are using some self-expression through um, artwork and just trying to tell their life stories. So giving them a different outlet other than just with the words, but how can they visually represent their life stories as well? Our seventh grade ELA classes have been finishing a slam poetry unit. Um, and there was definitely a buzz in the seventh grade hallway during this unit of um, funny poetry to very emotionally charged and deep topics wherever the students kind of wanted to lead it. Um, but they were definitely inspired by the unit and it was a lot of fun to um, see students taking risks. I know that as a teacher in the seventh grade hallway, students were bringing me poetry at the end of math to like be like, hey, Mrs. Hunter, how's this one? How's this one? And so it was just a lot of fun to see them really diving into that unit and going for it. Uh, our sixth grade Read 180 program is moving our kids leaps and bounds. Uh, we have nine kids that are going to be exiting out of Read 180 for sixth grade. And 
in the morning block and afternoon block, you can see just the growth in their Lexile, which is their reading levels and growing by an average of 72 points and 87 points is phenomenal for those kiddos. Just a quick thing about that season. Yeah. Or should I wait for the end? Okay. Uh, so if I'm if I'm understanding that correctly, that's a, a program that gets sixth grade kids that weren't quite at a sixth grade reading level reading level. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Yep. Right. So at Talmage, we actually have two reading programs that are general for we have our system 44 reading program and we have our read 180 program and so there are read 180 classes at the different grade levels not just at sixth grade and let me just add it's an intervention program to help oh. uh, move students uh, grade levels so if they're behind in grade levels allows them to have that extra time um, to work on those english language arts um, and again, when they talk about the Lexile, that's really about their reading growth. Um, so moving on to math, our seventh grade math team put together a gallery for our proportions unit, which is a huge piece of that curriculum. And so students had a choice of a type of project that they wanted to do from scaling objects to creating advertisements or scaling pictures. Um, and so it was a lot of fun to see them showcase both um artistry through math but also um get a chance to show off their creativity within that project that's my son's pencil but <laughs> i almost <laughs> brought it in he's one that came with me and it's like huge, huge <laughs> and it writes so very cool <laughs> I am um, just an update on our ILC, which is our intensive learning center. Um, the intensive learning center is a special programs classroom that focuses on functional academics and life skills for students with the, whose disabilities limit their ability to succeed in general education classroom and resource classroom settings. Academic instruction is given in a self-contained classroom setting to allow a differentiated and slower rate of instruction and more time and opportunities to practice skills so that students can master them. ILC students participate with their general education peers and electives supported by special education staff when needed. Using some of the MICF grant money, uh, students did an enrichment unit where they got to paint on canvases and tie dye shirts. They also are working with our TMS greenhouse. They have been cleaning it out, pulling weeds, and they've been planting seeds as well. Uh, they picked their first harvest of strawberries um, and have also transplanted some green, be green beans and zucchini. They also help clean up around the school as well. So these kiddos are involved in a lot of different things around our building, which is really cool to see. Our ELD students have been working on a unit based around the book Wonder, um, and recently part of that unit they've been working on their precepts, um, and so you'll see some precepts up there of all love, no hate, you attract what you are, not what you want, if you want great, then be great, never give up, and so they're really finding some lessons in there that I feel like we could all hang on to as true precepts. Our concert choir also had a concert, I believe it was last week, and their theme was light. Uh, the concert went very, very well, and we had two students there who composed and performed their own original pieces. Um, and we also had many students doing solos. Uh, our faculty choir called the Daisy Chain, made up of multiple of our staff, um, performed beginning and end pieces as well as their own song. Overall, this was a huge triumph. Um, it was really awesome. At the end of the at the end of the school year, um, they also did awards where students voted on most inspirational and most improved. And the teachers also did a teacher's choice top cat award. Our art program has recently been able to um, partnership with the Indie Commons for a downtown gallery where community members were able to go and see the artwork that the students have completed and an ability for families to come see the student artwork, which has been an awesome partnership. And if you click through, you'll see all sorts of things that our students created. That's still there at the Commons? 
I believe it just closed, yeah, it but just closed. we're excited to continue that partnership and get to show work on a regular basis. Uh, one of our electives at Talmadge is the calligraphy class. And also through the MICF grant, um, our teacher was able to gather supplies and curriculum and students have been creating cards for the office staff and for teachers. And we have this program called Character Strong as well. And they're actually putting up artwork and everything around the building. So it's really fun as you walk around, if you get a chance to go through Talmadge outside teachers doors and anything that's calligraphy that comes from our calligraphy class. And they're really super duper proud. Like I had kids email me extra things to put into the presentation today. <laughs> Um, we started our student of the week recognition program, which has been extremely successful. So every week we give the kids our target area and what we'll be looking at. And then at the end of the week, um, each staff member is able to recognize students that we feel met that goal. And through this program, we have recognized about 75% of our students in that um, of being successful with our goals. So it's been awesome. Um, we also have this program called WEB. It is our eighth graders that take on the responsibility of getting our sixth graders involved. Uh, WEB stands for where everybody belongs. At the end of May, we had all of the fifth grade classes and schools come in and do a tour of Talmadge. Um, this quote comes from uh, one of our Ash Creek folks. Uh, the WEB leaders did such a great job in the morning. They worked hard, were kind and patient and made Ash Creek Elementary students feel welcome and supported. Um, if you'd like to play that video, it's just kind of the entrance of these fifth graders entering in our school. Maybe. After they got that awesome welcome, they were also able to, on the next slide, you'll see, um, write down some of They were able to write down some of their hopes for what they're hoping to accomplish and hoping to see next year. And all their hopes are written on little slips that are within that rainbow. They also had an opportunity to write down some of their fears, which are the raindrops. So the whole goal of this is that when they return in the fall to remind them that now as they're all coming from separate elementary schools, they are all part of one class. And that's just like another sense of unity that can say, hey, my words are up here um, and that they contributed to something already in our school. Our AVID program hit a huge milestone this year. Um, the senior class that is graduating is actually our first class that ever started at Talmadge Middle School. So we have officially seen one of our Talmadge classes go through the whole process and um, reaching that stage. And so on May 19th, we were able to pull the seniors back together down to Talmadge to open up their time capsule together that they created in eighth grade. So it's really fun to um, just kind of see that full process that we kind of started them off on. They have done an amazing amount of job and I hope um, the high school gets to share out about the awesome things that they've done, but the amount of scholarship money and their plans and their careers that they have been able to explore and kind of set them on that path. It's really exciting to see where they are. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so as this slide, you'll see some of our current AVID students. So currently, our middle school AVID students are working hard on spring tutorial processes, um, working on STEM projects here in this picture, relational capacity, getting to know each other, um, completing their college and career research. So they do have, they know what their path forward is, and they have that chance to explore, to feel confident. Um, and our eighth graders have their classes that explore what to take at the high school. And then this past Friday, we were actually able to go on our first college field trip in a very long time. And um, we were able to take all four classes. So both eighth grade AVID classes, AVID seven and AVID six over to Western Oregon University for our student, a student panel with some of their students 
a tour of the university and to eat lunch there, which is always a big deal for them. <laughs> Uh, our LGBTQ plus affinity group was able to raise $2,000 in backpacks and supplies for our homeless teens. Um, they added their voice to the national anti-bullying campaign. Um, they have worked together to create community, um, support one another. They have had a lot of fun. They've shed some tears. And they also work on strategies to deal with bullying and promote self-care and good mental health. Um, I wish I could be more involved with this. Um, program. And whenever I'm not coaching and have a free Monday, I get to go there and just the way they interact and support each other and just pump each other up is just amazing to see. And not only are they doing that for each other, but they're like $2,000, like that's insane. -o. And they got to deliver those to those teens. And it was a great experience for them all. A club that we have at Talmadge Middle School this year that has been extremely successful is our 3D printing club and driver operated robotics club. And so students have been working on building and programming driver operated robots and designing objects with the CAD software before slicing and printing the objects. Um, there was so much interest in the club that they actually had to split it into four different five week club sessions. Um, and it has been amazing to see what the students have put together and learned through that club. Is that an elective or an after school club? It's after school. Oh, and uh, sorry. <laughs> Another after school club that has been meeting is our film club. They have put together a show, and that this is their trailer. It's really short if you're willing to watch it. Mm -hmm. They're doing a screening on June 9th. Yes. Place because I, I have I, I watch this over the weekend. I'm so bummed. So I, I will contact and ask some of my students and um, Miss Me Mrs. Messenger about that. But they these kids are super stoked. I have multiple of them in my prides. There's a bunch of sixth graders and they're like, it's a five episode series. So they're <laughs> they're super jazzed about this. And just I saw that I'm like that looked like it was professionally made. So these kids are getting like mm -hmm. such awesome awesomeness. Uh, last, last thing here, um, our track for meet of champions, we had eight of our kiddos go to our meet of champions. Um, this is the most we've had in a long time and they did phenomenal. We had a Kayla that placed 36 in the 100 meter JT placed 41st in the 100 meter and got 12th in high jump and jumped a height of five, two cow placed 44th in the 100 meter and 15th in the 200 meter. Ryan placed 15th in the 400 meter with a new PR of 56.62 seconds. Ty placed 27th in the 800 and 10th in the 1500 with a new PR of four minutes and 38.1 seconds. Anna Cole placed 27th um, in the shot put and fifth in dis discus with a nine foot PR 
um, which is a personal record. So 80 feet and one inch. Our four by four team placed 21st and that consisted of Aiden, Ty, Ryan, and Jason. And our four by one team, which was Aiden, Ryan, Jason, and Cow placed 16th overall and had a new PR of 49.99 seconds. Uh, these kids did phenomenal. These athletes were really fun. They just had the best time. Um, and if you click through uh, the slides, you'll see some more pictures of all of them um, in various different events. It was just a good time and we couldn't be more proud of these kids. And this is the first year that we were back after two years off. So our sixth seventh and eighth graders all joined track for the first time this year, which was an experience of itself. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Nana. I kind of wanted to comment on, on your guys' presentation. And I think uh, I'm not sure how, how much you pay attention. And, and I know a lot of us have, um, seen what's what's posted on community chats about Calmed and it's very, very negative. So when I see something like this, it makes me very happy. And and I like that uh that you're highlighting those things. I hope some of those people that are that are not happy with with TMS or are, are taking note that that there is great things happening at Talmadge. Um I also want to recognize Coach Jay Glassman in the back, uh, track coach. The uh coach is it over a hundred kids this oh, yeah. this track program 115. 115 kids i struggle with 30 kids in a wrestling room i can't even imagine the cat herding going on in there uh props to Talmadge. that's all i want to say i would also like to point out um my son was in avid and it was one of the most powerful things i've ever been to to see the relationships that they created and both of my kids have talked about it, but Cole is the only one who's been a part of it. And many of those students in that evening spoke of specific teachers and how they've changed them. And also the home that they have built. There were 15 of them and they raised over $326,000 in those kids. And it's an incredible program. Thank you guys. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for listening. Um, I'm Laura Waite and I'm the AVID 12 teacher and I just wanted to kind of bookend uh, what these fabulous humans over here talked about. Um, yeah, we had 15 students who started out as AVID 8th graders at Talmadge uh, um, come through and finish up as AVID 12, and we finished up the year, uh, like Darcy said. Um, the whole point of um, the AVID 12 year is to, uh, there's two points. First of all, get them into college or university, that's our goal, and also to find them as, men, as much money as humanly possible to pay for that experience. They don't have to go and they don't have to claim the money, but they do have to go through the process. So uh, as far as those numbers go, 15 kids, 100% of them were accepted into college or university. And uh, they, with 15 kids were able to raise, like Darcy said, uh, $326,000 in uh, scholarships and grants in that process. And that's not all of it, actually. We haven't even done senior night yet, uh, senior awards night yet at Central. I know that some of them will be receiving other scholarships that they don't know about. We had to, we drew a thermometer like to kind of gauge like it going up and we broke two. We had to rewrite it twice because we had so many, <laughs> um, so much money coming in and we're not done yet. So so there's a lot to be proud of with these kids. And I just wanted to be sure that you, the board heard about that. Thanks, Thank Laura. The next up is our financial and program reports. We have an update tonight on our English language arts proficiency. So I'm gonna have them make their way up for us. Joining us this evening to give an overview of our ALPA achievement and domain growth, uh, the district's overall 21-22 attendance data and a snapshot of our K-5 reading data 
from our third universal screener is Director of Student Growth and Achievement, Brian Flannery, and our Director of Emergent Bilingual Programming, Holly Monroy. This report the, this evening is connected to the strategic plan goal of student growth and achievement and one of the district's key objectives, develop plans focused on K-12 alignment of common core standards, assessment, programming, curriculum, and instructional method frameworks for a regular rigorous learning environment. It also highlights two data points in, our, in how we measure our progress in Central School District strategic plan, specifically chronic absenteeism and English language growth and academics. So with that, who am I turning it over to to start? With that, I'm turning it over to Director Monroy to begin. Good evening, Superintendent Kavista, members of the board and the Central community. I'm here to talk about the English language proficiency assessment data and look at both achievement and focus on growth. And I'm excited to share with you all tonight. So just a snapshot of our numbers right now um, in program receiving services as emergent bilinguals or English learners, we have 537 students. And there's just a breakdown by school and it'll just help you kind of frame the, the data when we look at it. Um, we do have 29 students on a waiver. That means that their families have chosen to opt out of receiving direct services. And we have 147 students on monitor status. And those are the four years that follow um, after the student reaches proficiency and uh, exits the program. That's not included in those top numbers. Those are not included in the top number, no, thank you. So just, an overview of achievement for ELPA. It's looking at proficiency in four domains. It's looking at reading, writing, and speaking, and listening. And speaking of proficiency, we had 27 students reach proficiency this spring on the ELPA summative, and that's exciting. So we celebrate with them. We had two students at the high school. Next, next slide, please. Five students at the middle school, nine students at Ash Creek, seven students at Independence Elementary, and four students at Monmouth. So we congratulate them, as well as all of the students who made growth. So speaking of growth, it is important to look at the growth overall. There are a few ways we can look at growth. Students can make growth by overall proficiency level. So they may move from emerging overall to progressing overall or to proficient. And so we can look at that growth. We can also look at growth by domain. So students can make growth within like the reading, the writing, the listening, or the speaking. And so just for this data set that's going to follow, we needed two data points to look at growth. So we're looking at 397 students. Our kindergartners only have one summative ELPA assessment data point, and we do have some students still that through the years of um, the pandemic were remotely identified, and so they don't have two data points for us to look at. So we look at the overall proficiency level. We wanted to focus on two important points. We had 10% of our students in the district make a growth by proficiency level overall. But it's also important to note that we had 83% of the students who were able to maintain. And I think that through the pandemic and you know everything that that has an impacted, I think that's important to note that that they did, they they maintained stable their um, overall proficiency level. And we're going to look at growth by domain. This is the super exciting slide. Uh, this shows students who made at least growth in one domain. There are students in this data set who maybe made growth in two or three or even four domains. But we had 61% of our students in our district um, make growth in at least one domain. So, and then you can see the breakout by school. Very exciting to see the growth by domain. Looking at reading specifically, the district had 27%, next slide please, 27% of growth in the reading domain, and you can see the breakout by school. This way, there we go. So I know that focus is always, um, the reading focus is very important, and that's something that we've all been working um, 
working on and teachers and students alike and staff. So it's exciting to see. In the writing domain, overall as a district, also 27%. You can see the breakout by school. And then in listening, we have 30% growth. And then speaking, this is where we have the most growth as a district overall. And if you see the levels are a little, a little more consistent by building. So we do have a focus on structured student talk and academic discourse as a goal for our program, as well as academic language and vocabulary building. And we will continue that focus into the next year. Um, next slide, please. We'll continue that focus into the next year as well, as well as continuing to increase opportunities for our multilingual learners. It's exciting. We, at the elementary, will be looking at the language arts adoption, the work with benchmark, and building ELB units uh, that match those thematic units within benchmark. Thank you. <laughs> within benchmark. And then we also, at the secondary level, are looking where um, students can have integrated ELD and receive language acquisition services more directly related to their content area. Those among many other initiatives, including our two-way immersion program that's starting at Independence Elementary, they're all exciting opportunities for our multilingual learners. So I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I have, I have a question about the emergent um, dual language, is it dual language immersion? Two-way immersion two program? Immersion? Yeah, two-way immersion. Is that, uh, is that group class full? I remember there's only a certain amount of students that are going to be able to start. Is that? I can't give still? you an official update from today, but my last conversation with Dr. Smith was that there was still some space in that class. Okay. I'm super excited. For All right. Well, thank you very much. There's no other questions for Holly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Holly. Great work. Thanks. Okay, next slide. We're uh, going to uh, give an update on attendance. Uh, these definitions for chronic absenteeism and regular attender, you've, you've seen them a couple times before this, this school year. Uh, so um, I just put them up there again for you, just a, a reminder of how we calculate this. Go on to the next slide. So um, on the right hand side is uh, our overall uh, district chronic absenteeism rate, which is 43.13. This was as of last, I want to say last Wednesday. So it fluctuates a little bit over, over the course of time, but that's where we were last Wednesday. And then you had 56.87 uh, not chronically absent within the district. Go on to the next slide. This is a breakdown uh, by school. You can see again on the bottom is the not chronically absent. So the numbers you're seeing in the light blue are the not chronically absent. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a breakdown by the grade level. Um, and it goes K through 13. 13 would be some of our students that are returning for um, an additional year past, uh, past 12. So we have students that we uh, continue to provide services for during that time. Okay, next slide. This is a breakdown, and, and again, we we only show uh, the, the two groups here because uh, the other numbers are, are uh, small enough that uh, we uh, need to not show those those data because the students become identifiable at that point. So those are the breakdown. Oh, okay, <laughs> EL uh, versus non-EL. So on the on the left side is the non-EL students uh, emergent. Uh, so this would be all the emergent uh, bilingual students that that Holly was presenting uh, data to on earlier today. And then on the right side, these are RBL. Next one here is uh, special education for, and students that are not receiving special education. And again, on the, oh, can you go back for a second? Well, I'm just a little, okay, thanks. Um, on the bottom again, I just want to make sure you clear so that the one on the bottom is the not practically absent because it's covered up a little bit on that topic. Okay, next slide. And this is um, low income. 
uh, versus not low income. And that's where we have uh, the largest uh, uh, difference, uh, disproportionality there of all, of all the groups that we're looking at. And the next one there is a trend over the course of years. Um, this is a really a tough one because of the years that we've had. I, I would caution not to read too much into, into this trend over the past few years because uh, greatly impacted by COVID, uh, 2020 um, is definitely skewed by uh, the way that that year ended as well as 2021 and our current year too, is it, we're still seeing that effect. So I think what uh, will be really important for us to look at is, is where we're at right now um, versus where we're at at the beginning of, of next year in the, in the fall and setting some targets for where we want to try to get back to those numbers of, of 2019 and, and, and above when it comes to the attendance that we have. Next slide. This is the, the trend uh, by school over those years. You can see that um, uh, we were uh, higher slightly in, in all of the, as far as attendance was higher slightly in all the schools in 2021. But again, attendance was a very, unusual year for attendance, but you do see that um, uh, a really nice growth by, uh, uh, by, the, by our middle school as far as uh, lowering the rate of chronic absenteeism this year. So this is not chronically absent. This, this right here um, is uh, the rate of, of uh, oh, sorry, this is the rate of, of chronic absenteeism, actually. Would be I, I don't want to speak for for Talmadge and and all this. Jen, you look like you're name. Yeah, I would just say I think there's been some outreach. Um, I think the staff has done a good job of connecting with students. I think as was displayed today in some of the work that they're doing in clubs, activities, etc. I think that has helped in how they've expanded their programming. But I'll follow up with Perry to get more details of that and put that. It's, just, it's, it's hard. I to think it's data. Feel good about it because it's at the top level. You know, Forty percent of your kids are chronically absent, mm -hmm. and it's ten percent of the time. But still, it's uh, well, that seems like concerning. Better it's be doing better. Mm -hmm. So it would be below ninety percent uh, attendance is is what would what what would qualify uh, for not for them to be chronically absent. I think the other thing for for middle for last year is, and I wasn't here last year, so I couldn't say for hundred percent. But I think most school districts were experiencing is that you're gonna have higher attendance the year that was distant for our elementary than you will with, with middle. There's gonna be a lower percentage of kids that are gonna attend. So uh, as we came back into person, I think uh, the middle school students definitely benefited from all the support and being able to be back in person was a, was a real our support for them. You're right, it is. Where we <laughs> sort of enter next year would be a key indicator, so I'm hoping that we're Sort of finding everything that we can find that get kids back in school that they need. Absolutely. Brian, is it, is it possible that this does, data doesn't show us how far off we are? Once you hit that 10%, boom, you sort of fall off the cliff into this other category mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. relative scale between chronic and not chronic. Is there a way to get data that says on average how far we so we know how far yep. generally we have to move? to get the students above that 90%. I, uh, the, the last time I presented to you on absenteeism, I gave you more of those bands right. that show that breakdown. Okay. We, we had a lot on our agenda tonight, so right. I didn't have as many data slides, but I can come back next time okay. and give you where we closed, closed out for the, the year okay, in awesome. our next meeting. And I can give you some bands where it will show you how close we were, okay. because you're right. The, and and it'll, it'll be good to look at it at the very end of the year, because it sometimes is a matter of, of one day difference for a student to be over into that that range. And I think looking at those bands is helpful. So I'll, I'll do that for next time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there something about um, order on operations um, with regards to skipping and seniors? Is there any, <laughs> sorry. What, I, what's the um, question? Yeah. They announce that seniors skip, like seniors compared to like maybe freshmen to juniors. 
So there's a couple things with, with seniors to consider. Senior senior attendance across the entire state is always lower. It's yeah. of the four years, it's gonna be the lowest, almost always gonna be the lowest. You also have fewer days. Mm -hmm. So every day, so seniors have a fewer numbers, not huge, but yeah. there's a fewer number of days. So every day they miss counsel just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And you have seniors that are going on, on, on various, uh, trips to visit colleges to do other things and so there's going to be a higher rate of absenteeism that's going to happen with the seniors the if you were to look can you go back to the slide i mean when can you go back to the breakdown of grade level yeah no like when i call in right there um the 12th grade is kind of covered up but the 12th, if you were to look at the high school attendance rate as compared to previous year's trend over time, mm -hmm. um, our 12th grade attendance rate for chronic absenteeism is about where it's been for a number of years. It's not much higher than previous years. You, it's, it is um, one of those things where you're always working with seniors in a high school to try to get the attendance rate up. So how, how are we doing that, I guess? I don't know if that's an appropriate question, but what are we doing to try to beat that up instead of they hit a certain part in their senior year and then you know what i'm not graduating so let's just not go anywhere well we'll follow up and get some feedback from the administration there on okay. what their strategies are okay specific to the okay what i'm going to say is unexcused absence yeah, is where it would fall under yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's and that's state driven yeah Okay, so we want to go on to the, we good? I'll bring some more data back as far as breaking that down and, and we'll give some more information. So about Brian, what do, you, what do you think are the key takeaways from, from this? I think, uh, honestly, I think the key takeaway is that um, what we're what we're seeing isn't isn't different than other other places are seeing, and and in some cases with our with our grade levels, we're seeing higher attendance than I would say some of the schools around us are are, are seeing. I think the the biggest takeaway is that the impact um, that the year has had on attendance, the past couple of years have had on attendance. When you think about the fact that we've had people um, out, both students and and um, their family members out for illness at various times. I think that what you're seeing and and those those rates is that. I think trying to get kids back into a routine of being in school, um, it's it's always going to be a struggle for a period of time to, to do that. And I would definitely say that um, while the numbers aren't where we want them, I think um, it's it's amazing. Um, to 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 uh, also the efforts that have been put in by by staff by um, everybody in, in each of the buildings to to welcome the kids to welcome them back with everything that they're trying to they're struggling through each day uh, to show up and to continue to show up and I think we have to keep on remembering that we're talking about a matter of a number of days that they've missed they've missed ten percent but when you look at how many days that we have you know, and how many how many days kids have been out for, for various illnesses on top of everything else that, that comes up for them, that we're, we're, we're still have um, uh, really great efforts that, that have happened by the staff to do that. Is this an area where we should be setting a goal for next year? I, I definitely kind of think so. I think out. that talking with each of the, the, the buildings and as, as they get some chance at the end of the year here to, to look and reflect on that and see what they're what they look like pre-COVID, and you have to also take into account that we're taking. I think everybody's working harder to get better data on attendance and making sure that attendance is tracked really well. But I think looking back pre pre-COVID, setting a goal based on what we've seen this year, and then looking towards trying to reach those pre-COVID uh, dates, um, and and setting some goals for sure, and then breaking it down a little bit to see where is it that each of the buildings, I gave you a snapshot of, of the overall, but each of the buildings breaking down what what are um, what are some student groups that we could um, be focusing on to, to, to help support that. It's one of our, it's one of our objectives, Correct. Right? And it, yes, it is one of our um, how we measure our progress, one of the 13 areas that we're looking yeah. at. And again, that's one of this, the mandatory uh, state data points we're required to 
track and report on. But the yeah, some of the conversation we were having earlier is about setting goals where we say this is an important metric for the upcoming year, yep. then we would assume there's some type of plan. And then you're yep. next year, we're looking at the data, but you're also reporting on the specific, Yeah, each building should have a plan and like, what are they doing? So that that's that's the path, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's gonna be an important part of it for, for next year, for sure. Okay. Ready to go on? All right, so, uh, Next up, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. We did have a, a request. Um, Mr. Ward, you wish to speak a little bit more directly in your mind. Uh, live stream and hear me in some way or we'll lean back. If you speak a little bit more into your mind, uh, that would help out. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Park. Thank you. So, uh, language arts, uh, we're going to look at K through five language arts as a focus for update. Um, we're going to stop there for just a second. I um, want to talk about a, a few things before we look at the data. Um, next board meeting, I'll bring back math and we can also uh, look at other grade levels. Uh, we are still, um, we opened up the window to, to extend the window for completing these. So this isn't 100% of the students, but it's pretty close for the K-5 reading, are very close to uh, to all of the students that we tested the first, um, first in, in the uh, fall and then again in winter, then in spring. So what we're gonna look at tonight is, um, was there growth between the, the uh, fall and the uh, spring? I think the other thing I wanna point out is probably the, the biggest uh, thing that's gonna impact next year, I believe in this area, is the fact that um, a, a team of, of teachers from um, our elementaries uh, worked on on alignment of, of the standards, worked on the essential standards, and worked on on um, along with some of some of you in the room too on helping to uh, pick a, a core curriculum for uh, language arts for ne for next year and uh, for LA I should say for, for language yeah language arts for next year on um, both for the Tweed program and for uh, language arts program and um, I think that it's hard to uh, look at data when you're using a universal screener, when you don't have that core in place. Next year, it's gonna be really telling about how um, we're doing by looking at that universal screener and how that implementation is having an impact on those scores. We had a return for students again to the classroom. We had a, a number of kids, especially at this level that we're about to look at as far as early reading that um, missed out on so much in the past, uh, couple of years because of uh, what we saw. And we have that combined with uh, core programs coming in. The other thing is that we are learning more about the testing and more about the fidelity of, of delivering that test. Timing is an important piece, how we use those results. I just wanna say one more time, thank you to all the teachers that worked on that. They they did an incredible job this year of, of a um, reading mastery as far as uh, uh, using that as a intervention, the, the alignment work that did, the adoption work that they did, and then the use of the universal screener and how to get the most out of that. We had a number of, of places that piloted the use of it, and it was really um, important for the impact and the growth that you're gonna see. So next slide, please. So again, this is looking from, uh, in our early reading, our kindergarten and first grade, which all year have been the most impacted uh, group as far as reading because of that that timing that happened with COVID. And you see 39% are at that typical growth and aggressive. And I also wanna remind you that this is not um, growth according to within the district, this is a nationally norm growth for pre-COVID. So what we're seeing here is that they, um, despite everything that we, we have seen, they still had 39% growth as compared to pre-COVID times nationally. So. I just want to make sure that context is there for, for this. Next slide, that's ACEs. Um, IES, you can see that they have 30, um, I'm sorry, 41%, which is which is a, a huge accomplishment. Um, we, we know that uh, there's been a lot of work um, that they're doing, including that, that work towards the, the two-way immersion program. So lots of growth there. Next slide. And we're in MES and 
we're seeing uh, 57 percent were in that aggressive to typical growth. Again, um, lots of, of improvement over the course of that this this year. Go into the next. The next is a reading, which is again the looking at se second grade through fifth grade, and you see um, these are students that that did uh, have some time with us uh, prior to COVID, and you can see the growth that they had for uh, ACEs of 49% uh, were at that mark, which is getting up to that place where we want to be in a normal year, let alone uh, want to get it above there, but it's, it's a, it'd be good for a normal year, let alone a year like we've had. Next, IES. Oh, what's that? Okay, um, IES, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 59. I'm not doing my math very fast tonight. 59%, which is a, a pretty amazing mark that they, they hit. And uh, I just want to kind of go back to this one. And that 26% and 25% that we're seeing and the high, higher number in ACES as far as that aggressive growth, again, that's that's uh, compared to nationally and uh, pre-COVID year. So we're, we're seeing a lot of wonderful work that's being done by our teachers there. Next, next slide. And our student, I, I keep on saying teachers, and the students and the families that are supporting them. Um, and so MES, the last one there is 58% uh, are in that typical the aggressive growth. So um, I think that might be the last slide that we had. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it was. Last one was questions. So again, I think that um, I'm going to anticipate the question as far as how we're going to set some, some goals, Steve. Um, I think that we're at a, a good place to start setting some goals, but looking at the, that implementation of a core curriculum that we're bringing in, part of the work that we're doing over the summer and at the very beginning of the school year is helping to get the training in place for use of that core curriculum. And also at the same time, how does it match up with the use of the universal screener? and our reading intervention programs that we have across the district. There's been a lot of work uh, done throughout the year, but especially here at the end of the year to start making those plans for how we're gonna do that and be able to set goals. Some of the things that we'll be able to bring back next year too is the progress monitoring. This is a universal screener, but we will be able to talk about some of the progress monitoring tools that uh, the teachers are using in order to make those, those, uh, those growths in between when we're doing the universal screening. And so um, there just uh, was, I don't know, Julie, Julie and, and the group of like 30 or 40 people of, across the elementary group just did amazing work. And so I uh, just can't say enough for everything they put in and the extraordinary year of coming after school and doing that, that work has been incredible. So I just want to say thank you. Any questions? Yep. So I'm looking at the data, not a for any specific school, but I'm just trying to understand. So this, so let's look at Ash Creek, 17% had a showed aggressive. That means 17% of the students at Ash Creek showed aggressive growth. Is that correct? Showed aggressive growth okay. when you compare it nationally. So let's just put that into terms is that we're looking at what would be across the, con the country. And we, we want to go back that they're looking over the course of about five years of data which would have been in around 2000 and uh, roughly 2012 to 2017, somewhere okay. in that range. So pre-COVID, they were looking at what would we have liked to see as aggressive growth across about 2 million students that took okay. the test. And so our students ranked in that aggressive growth range uh, for that. Okay. So, so this is a true bell curve statistically how we compare against others. Showing how we compared against, uh, against others. So it's, an, it's a norm thing. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's key. I mean, when you look at the two purples and we're sitting almost all three schools at over 50% growth, that that is significant growth. I mean, and, that is huge accomplishment by our students first and foremost and the staff. And I, I'll just amend one thing. It's 50% a typical to, to aggressive. Thank you, Brian. It's it, the, the other students are, are making growth as well. Right. It's just that where we want typical and, and aggressive growth. So, um, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Thank you.
Thanks, Brian. It's actually really interesting. I mean, it is really good progress. And I was thinking about how do we keep the momentum that we've talked about and make sure that the kiddos that are in the lower end of this, that we understand what to do to move them along as well, because we don't want anybody falling behind. And, so, and, and this is another one where the last thing I'll say is that if we were to break this down again, back to Byron, what you were talking about, if we were to take the time to show much more detailed reports, you'd see that for a number of the kids, it was very close for them to be tipping over into either a normal or aggressive. If we, um, as we uh, work on training more on implementation of, of the, the test, sometimes the, the timing of how long it takes to hit stop when you're doing the timer, that can make a difference as well. So there's a lot of things like that that we're gonna get better with as we, as we do more training and work together, but, um, I think that this is on the low end of where the kids are actually at and the progress that they've made. So that's, that's impressive too, is that we're going to get to a place where it's, it's more and more accurate and um, able to, to be more and more useful for the, for the staff and students. And then I'll just add one piece and you correct me if I'm wrong. I think one of the key things is this is also tied to, you know, these are standards, which is also connected to our um, SBAC. So our standards based or excuse me, our state assessment. Um, so it will be, I mean, again, that's one measure. It's not all the measures, but uh, being able to see this growth and then as our third, really through fifth grade, because we don't do K through two, uh, to look at that when we get those scores and then just be able to dive in further, both on the growth side and achievement and being able to have those correlations is gonna be a really good conversation for us of, again, when we talk about student growth, Brian's been showing us, or Director Flannery's been showing us the growth, and then obviously SBAC's gonna be tied to the achievement side. So how those correlate and are the programming and again, the curriculum, the interventions, those assessments working collectively together to really move us through that growth and achievement. And in the, in the early data, I'll say one of the things that we'll look at math next time, but um, the first two times that we looked at the data for math were higher than the, the reading. So that was promising as well. And we're continuing to work in that area as well. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Next up is our safety and security report. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, we didn't get you guys earlier. Thank Perfect. you, Mr. Clark. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Rosalind from Power Peers, and I'm going to basically catch you guys up of what we've been up to this past month. Well, last month, we wrapped up our Monday updates, which are basically, it's basically supposed to mimic like a news broadcast team. And we basically informed the students of sports events, um, clubs going on, school activities. We have a fun segment called Student Shenanigans. It's basically um, someone just asked random questions to the students and they seem to really like it. And also, uh, last the past Friday, we had a fundraiser um, for the Salem Free Health Clinic. And we had a fundraiser, which was pie in the face. And you could pie a power pierce in the face and you could just pie them in the face to earn money for that. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for waiting. I, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Come on up. You're next. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Um, I'm in Asbeck. My name is McKenna, and I'm here to share what we've been up to lately. So um, this last Friday, we had a yearbook party, which was like an end of the year yearbook signing kind of event. And recently, we've purchased some field games like Giant Chess and Giant Checkers, Yahtzee, Jenga, Connect Four, and those are all enlarged. And then um, <laughs> we've also bought some pool tables and foosball tables and air hockey tables for our common areas in our school. So that'll be kind of something to connect students next year. Um, we had our seniors last day assembly. And then after that, we had classes move around to their new areas of the gym because it's section by grade. And so we all got to move into our new sections. Um, we're going to be working on a schedule for the 2020 to in 2023 school year to submit to ad or admin so that 
we can kind of get it or get behind it earlier. Um, what else? We had a really successful or successful spring fling and staff appreciation week, and those went wonderfully. Freshmen won for the spring fling, so that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, staff appreciation went great. We served breakfast for them or for them a couple times, and we kind of just did like little things to show our support. And yeah, I think that's all I have. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, McKenna. Thank you. And again, thank you. My apologies for not getting you guys up here sooner. Now for our safety and security report. So joining us this evening is our Director of Program Planning and Project Management, uh, Jason Clark, who also oversees the overall safety and security of the district. With what has taken place in Texas, tonight's presentation is focused on the district's standard response protocols and safety and security priorities. So please welcome Jason Clark. Thank you, Dr. Cabista, school board. Chair Love, thank you for having me this evening. Um, it's refreshing, refreshing being here and not talking about uh, COVID-19 data or safety protocols in that area. So thank you for the opportunity. And like Dr. Cabista said, with the recent tragedy in uh, Uvalde, Day, Texas, it really has raised many questions and concerns. And even in our own community, we have received phone calls and questions and um, just gives us an, an opportunity to evaluate and look at things as we, we move forward First slide I'd like to start with is our mission statement uh, for our district safety team, prevent what we can, prepare for what we cannot. And that's something that we talk about. It's There's a lot right there. It's a short statement, but it, it is a lot. Um, and a couple examples, prevent what we can. Um, those are things like locked doors, ID badges. Um, adult and parent volunteer forms, just some things like that that we have in place that helps with our safety and security process. Pre prepare for what we cannot. Some of the things that we have that is our standard response protocol drills, our monthly building safety meetings, district safety meetings, some of those things that we have in place as prevention. So I just wanna share a little bit with that uh, statement and what it does for us as it drives things. Next slide there, um, Central School District uses the standard response, response protocol as our emergency safety protocol. And I hope as you've traveled our schools and buildings, you've seen this poster and recognize the icons um, that are on here. Um, this particular program, um, there's about 30,000 schools across the US that use this standard response protocol uh, to enhance student and staff safety during an incident or emergency. So again, it's a highlight for us is again, common language K-12 in Spanish and English, uh, common safety protocols for students, staff and parents as they move from level to level throughout our district. Next slide. Again, the standard response protocol. I tell you, I'd love to take about uh, 30 minutes and in, uh, go into this a little bit deeper with you, but I just have a few minutes and I'd like to just give you a little mini lesson on the standard response protocol. Um, it is based on five actions that we take during an incident or an emergency. Hold, secure, lock down, evacuate, and shelter. Each action is followed by a directive. Each action then has a specific instructions or what to do in an emergency. When these are called on the PA, the action and directive are repeated. I'm just going to give you a little example of what you might hear or our students or staff might hear. An example might sound like, Please secure the building, get inside, lock outside doors. Secure the building, get inside, lock outside doors. Secure the building, get inside, lock outside doors. So again, three, we repeat those. Um, there is consistency with those statements. And again, our plan is for this to be students, staff hear this. And again, it's quick, we know what to do and we react accordingly. Next slide there. I have a quick question. Thank you. You bet. Jason, um, in, in that instance, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's the blue one. Yes. With the two hands. Um, and, it's, and it's probably, I, I just don't know. 
Yeah. Um, and I know we got an email asking why we don't lock doors. Are, are the doors not locked at all times? Yeah, you know, they are, um, but all it, it really depends on which doors we're talking about. And I tell you, it kind of leads in, you know, with our five buildings that we have sure. students in, right? Each building's unique um, with what it has. We have some very old well, buildings, some newer ones. Absolutely. So we do. That's a practice we want is locking perimeter doors when we can. Um, depending on the school, that's not always possible, but it is definitely a, a goal of ours to lock perimeter doors. And like during, I said, during school hours. During school hours, right? And again, it is a, it is a challenge uh, when we have open campus. For instance, at a high school, um, you know, we have students traveling from building to yeah. biddle, building between passing time. So there are some things, uh, but we do, we've had that discussion. Um, good question. I could talk a little bit more about secure and lockout in just a moment here, or lockdown. This next slide here, just, you know, part of our ODE requirements in division 22, and you've heard me talk about this, is we are expected as a school district to run emergency drills and share instruction. Um, over our safety plan. And that is what we do with our standard response protocol. We have our monthly emergency evacuation drills, shelter in place. We have two of those drills per year and two sa safety threat drills per year as well, uh, which could be again, locked down, the lockout or secure or hold. Next slide. This is an example here of a, a document that we use in each building just to track our emergency drills. Uh, so we can go back, take a look at everything from, um, again, response time, the time it started, the time we took us to execute the drill, uh, clear the building, get back in, weather conditions, um, special conditions that were involved. Um, it's a document that we refer to during the year and, and submit at the end of the year. Jason, do our... Um, first responders participate in the safety threat drills? They do, uh, Mr. Love. And I, uh, if you give me just a couple more slides, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. But our first responders absolutely do. And that's a big part of, of our safety plan. Next slide. Thank you. This slide, I just, uh, was a question we had regarding secure and lockdown. These are two of the of the five that are in our higher level. Secure is a low level uh, security. We have a threat outside of the building. Our report on that is get inside, lock outside doors, and it is business as usual. Um, really a secure, you know, secure could happen often, especially at a middle school or high school where there's the potential of something. We've heard of something potentially happening and we go into a secure mode. OK, um, and, you know, it, it's one of those that we've talked as a district and it, it's pretty common as you don't report necessarily uh, the secure our secure um, lockouts. OK, that's something within school you could have you could have 10 to 15 of these a year, really, depending on what the scenario is. Uh, but a secure should be a safety plan that you can go to pretty quickly. If it leads to a threat inside the building, that's when we would go to lockdown. And again, you can see on our lockdown, locks lights out of sight. That is one that we um, we train at each one of our buildings. Um, and I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. But again, secure is a lower level, not usually communicated to the public as we go through that. If it goes into a high level, um, lockdown incident is commuted, communicated to parents, guardians, community. Jason, is that a... a case where it seems like I've heard recent stories, I think one was even in Salem where there was somebody seen with a gun or something nearby and according to the news media that when the school went into lockdown, it sounds like what you're saying is we would go into secure mode. Is that well, right? that particular one, and I tell you, I know exactly what you're talking about and luckily we have good networking. We made a quick call to Salem Kaiser, uh, was on the line with uh, North Salem High School and it was, it was a, a person that walked off the street um, with, a, with a weapon into the building. Oh, and the building. that was the, that was the report. Yep, and they went into a full lockdown, Parish Middle School right next door. They secured that building and they had a couple elementary schools within the, the large, um, that map within, and they also just secured that. Matter of fact, they even had a, reunification plan uh, for the, the elementary schools on that particular day. So 
really depends on that information. Again, we're connecting quickly with our first responders. And once that weapon's involved and they're in our school, our protocol is we, we do step back and our, our first responders, IPD, MPD would take over at that point. Good question. Next slide. The question was asked if our first responders get involved and yes, we are. We're very grateful for our partnership with our, our first responders, Polk County um, Sheriff's Department, Monmouth Police Department, IPD, all have taken part in our uh, lockdown drills. Here's a, a little snapshot of us uh, not too long ago at Ash Creek getting ready for the lockdown drill with our first responders. Next. Here's another shot of uh, Miss Seidel and Monmouth Elementary School. This is after a uh, we've had a uh, the, the drill and it's a debriefing session that are very valuable. And you can see the team there of Polk County, Monmouth, and Independence Police. And thank you to our first responders. Next slide. One of the things, a lockdown, I just want to share with you real quickly the lockdown process. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things we had since the situation in, in Texas, we had some calls coming in. Do you practice uh, active shooter drills uh, in your schools? And one of the unique things about the standard response protocol is, again, um, several of those things fall under that lockdown process. Again, a weapon on campus, an active shooter threat in the building puts us into lockdown. Okay, so that's why we practice that. I wanted to give you a snapshot of what those little training pieces look like. There is work that goes into it, and they're very valuable. Uh, the first one, again, front-loading, uh, training and educating staff, students, and parents. Um, this is something that the building principals uh, lead the way, um, sharing that information with parents. And again, I'm thinking the elementary more or less as we get ready for this drill, um, just to make sure that everybody is aware of what we're doing and why we do it. We have a pre-drill meeting uh, with the first responders in the building safety team. Uh, we go over our game plan. The next piece when we're ready to go is the building administrator announces and repeats over the intercom, like I shared before. Again, this is a drill. Our school is now in lockdown, locks lights out of sight. This is a drill. The building administrator will lead that announcement. And then once we're done with that, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for us to go over the campus. Um, and at the conclusion of the drill, we give an all clear signal uh, that is made for the students and staff to know that it is all clear and we can continue business as usual. And then the last piece of that is the, the post meeting debrief. And it's just, again, very, very helpful. We talked about things that went well, uh, things that we need to improve on. Um, we review our, our notes from the past. Uh, take a look at things that uh, we can show growth in um, of understanding the standard response protocol. I know earlier in the year we did a, a lockdown drill. We had a couple locks on classroom doors that weren't working. We did another one, went across those locks on the doors and they'd been fixed. So those are the types of things that we do. We, we don't just run these to check the box, but we try to grow from each one of these trainings and drills that we do. Okay, so do we still have uh, SROs on properties? We do. Uh, yep. Yep. We have we have one and a half school resource officers. We have Officer Barlow at the high school full time, and we have Detective Fleming at stationed at Monmouth Elementary School half time. In the between the two of them, they they work K twelve. Um, so they go to all the buildings. They do. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I say Monmouth Elementary School? Oh. I'm sorry, Talmadge Middle School. Thank you, Cease. I just wanted to throw in a couple. I know that we are a data-driven district and wanted to share a little bit. This is, again, active shooter data um, that over 70% of um, active shooter uh, incidents, it's over in five minutes. So we talk about just how quickly things happen and, and how it ends. So it's, again, it's being prepared. Um, next slide, 90% are over in 10 minutes. 
So again, these are quick headers. They come and we've got to be ready and be ready to respond. All right, this next slide here, I just wanted to share a little bit about some of a few of the goals that we have that we talk about uh, that are priorities for us. Um, I'm not going to cover each one of these. I'm going to summarize to a certain degree, but I think the first three bullets talks about providing a safe atmosphere for our students, our staff, and our community uh, that come to our campuses outside of regular school hours. Okay, so having that in mind, as somebody comes to, uh, again, one of our, our plays, a Friday night football game, um, or again, um, just during, during the day, um, the education portion of it, devoting some time uh, to teach staff, students, and parents about the standard response protocol. Uh, another piece of the standard response protocol is the standard, reunif bless you, standard reunification method. Okay, and that is, again, you know, we had a situation that happened when we were picking up our students, especially at the elementary level. The bus is pushed by the school and we need to go to reunification mode. And how do we connect our kids with parents in a time of crisis like that? And then the last bullet, um, you know, a goal that we talked about amongst our district team with first responders, Central School District 13J will provide accurate and timely communication with first responders will work to provide exceptional response time to all emergency situations. So again, it really goes back to communication. I, I really feel like we are in a um, the community that we live in is special. Uh, we have just great teamwork. I'm gonna use some names here and I, I'm thankful for our, our new uh, Chief Haynes uh, from Monmouth Police Department. Chief Mason is another big resource for us. Uh, Chief Stingy at the Polk County Fire Department. These are people that we can call quickly and get some support, get some insight, um, just talk about the plan. So again, a great team that we have to work with. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about, and I, I just want to head on real quick, is social media. Um, you know, this has been for our district; it's it's, gonna, it's been a friend and a foe for us. Um, but we do we like getting reports through social media. We have Safe Oregon Tip Line, uh, which again, this is a poster that's around our middle school and high school um, in our community. It's an access number uh, tip line for parents for guardians. Um, they have a concern about a school, they could call this number. It's pushed to state police, local police, building administrators, and it just allows us to act on tips. Uh, sometimes those tips, um, you know, we treat all of them like they're real. And sometimes they lead to something, something sometimes they don't. But we encourage parents, um, community, if you hear something, please report it and let us look into it and try to get out in front of it. So do we post those on Facebook or? Uh, no, it's uh, it's called uh, Safe Oregon Tip Line. There's okay. a number on that that you call and it just it walks you right through the process. Yep. And then we have a certain group that's part of that for the Central School District, like I mentioned, with our first responders, building okay. administrators, our district safety team, and we get respond a response to that. So if somebody were to put one in tonight at 1130, that would come to us right away and We'd be ready to deal with it the next I, day. I would also add that, again, the non-emergency lines, both uh, police departments have those. Yep. Again, I think there are multiple ways to report any type of potential security concern. Mm -hmm. um, again, 911, again, that's if there is a true, true, that's really, really where you would go. But information, there are two different lines for both police departments um, also in that. So again, both the safe Oregon as well as Again, we have our partners that are with us and working with us on a daily basis. It might be clear to let the community know when it's okay to use Facebook and for what purpose and when it's not. You know, and, and Darcy, that's what I was talking about, a friend and a foe, right? Yeah. I mean, we do. We get some of those in and it's like, oh, oh here we go. Um, yeah. And we got... So um, I we, that yeah, absolutely. Uh, we want those messages coming in and yeah, some of them are a little tougher to work through than others. That's for sure. I'm going to, I know it's not in here, Jason, but would you just give the board um, just a quick overview of um, 
when we get the reports from the, our police as um, candle with care? Absolutely. Just yeah. as a, another strategy in, in our partnership. I sure will. And I'm going to throw out a kudo to Detective Thistle, who was our detective a couple years ago. And we started this program through the Polk County Threat Assessment Team. Um, and it's called Handle with Care. And oftentimes our first responders will show up to a anything from a domestic violence to a their house is on fire to a car accident. They'll see it's a potentially a child age student. And if they're K through 12, they send that message to the district to handle with care team. We have a district team that has a mental health counselor on it, myself, Dr. Cabista, a couple others that comes to us right from the officer. And uh, we push it right out to the building administrator on a need to know basis. And as the student enters the school the next day, we're aware of the student's needs. They had a traumatic experience potentially the night before, and we need to handle with care. And uh, it, it's great. It, uh, we've used it now. We've our numbers, you know, where we started um, the first year, and I wish I had some accurate numbers to share with you, but they've doubled in this past year of calls that we've had came, have come in to us. Um, we really appreciate this. We did, Britta, this is, Britta Santoni is, is great. She uh, was able to get some coffee cards, and we actually got those to each first responders and just said, thank you um, for those handle with care. You imagine those first responders in their intense situation. And then at the end, to take time to send a message to the school district. That's big. And we appreciate that. So it's just a small token. And um, yeah, thank you. I, let me share that. Hey, Any so other you, questions? I have a as, question. Please. Um, so based upon recent events, and as we go through kind of the overall process. Do you, are there specific things we should be looking at, especially things that might require funding to put into place to, to continue to, you know, just be prepared to harden? I mean, there's a lot of conversation now going on nationwide about hardening schools. So how do we assess that? When, when would we have a discussion along those lines? Well, um, I think I'd like to start with saying that it's an ongoing discussion that we we have. Um, we are looking at things. We've got things in motion currently. Um, I'll share a couple. The board approved our surveillance package. Okay, we're replacing all of our surveillance cameras and video uh, with updated um, some new cameras in hot spot areas. Uh, Steve, another thing that's on the table uh, from the uh, safety and security director uh, is, you know, at, at some point we're going to need to go to name badges district wide. What, okay, what do we do all, today? I thought we staff. did. I thought we had name badges. You know, but... And again, it's one of those. Again, we need to do it with fidelity and make sure everybody's doing it. And when we're walking down the hall and we see an adult that doesn't have a badge, we're asking them, can we help you? Um, what are you doing here? So, yeah, if you're coming in our house, you need to have a badge. And, you know, everybody needs to do it, Steve. So it's one of those um, where I think if we're going to put some of these in place, we make a commitment, we're going to do it, we're going to go with it. Uh, we have a plan. If a staff shows up and they forget their badge one day, they have a place to go and get another one. And it's, we're on with it. So, um, you know, most private sectors do have badges to get in and out. Um, I work with uh, Brian Weatherly, our uh, maintenance director. Reese is doing some great work for us right now. They're the surveillance and video contracting. We're looking at uh, electronic entry, some intercom, intercom systems for the front door. So again, the buttons pushed, the communications made, pictures taken. Um, and it takes our administrative assistant from going to that front door and answering it before they know who it is and what the issue is. So we're looking at several things um, like that that we can do. Um, again, Monmouth Elementary School, I just have a hard time not bringing that up as a Monmouth Elementary School student. And um, I mean, that was built as a neighborhood school. Uh, and you could enter it from any direction that you want and uh, walk right into your classroom. Uh, but the breezeways and the California model. And at this point, it is concerning. And you can get to the campus um, a few different ways. And we're in discussion on what we can do to tighten down the security uh, at those, those building sites like MES. 
So I named a few there, Steve. Um, I think that the wheels are always spinning, you know, and it's nice to get something. I feel like the surveillance and the video package was something that we've done. We're moving forward. I feel like the name tags um, is something that we can talk about and move forward with. Um, yeah, I I feel no, like we're moving. I mean, forward. that's an operational. It is topic, absolutely, and but, I and I hope yeah. I didn't get in trouble uh, yeah. bringing that up. Um, but yeah. no, I think again, my two cents is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's easy. It's, it's a policy discussion too, though, I think. Correct. I think, yeah. that, again, we have community that sees this very different. We have community members that want us to open all doors, keep things open, and we have community members that are leaning more towards the direction of having more safety and security within the buildings. Uh, my first couple of years here, because I went around and were able to get into doors and we made some changes and uh, um, some of our community members are not in agreement with that. They want our buildings to be open and anybody to come in. Those days are over. And again, I think the leadership of uh, Director Clark and what he's doing with not only the district team, but with the building teams uh, are continuing to, to move that, that forward. So it's not a, I, I, I want to be clear, I have lots or I have had community members be very clear that they want us to have very open and easy to access buildings. Uh, so it is a continued conversation uh, throughout and, and how we move forward uh, in these in these uh, policy and funding conversations, which yeah, absolutely the board is a part of. Yeah, that's what I mean, it's great. I mean, I love the work that you're doing and the updates, but I'm like thinking to myself, what else can we do? Where's that like, what are we learning? How can we support it from a board, whether it's a policy or a funding discussion? That's typically how we address it. When can we get to that discussion? I would also so. say our facility assessment planning that we're working through right now is a significant part of that. Um, we've had uh, the data last year that really analyzed all five of our buildings. That's part of this process, as well as you know some of the things that that we need to look at moving forward from uh, really future and what our facility assessment and how we move forward. I guess even the SRO staffing levels that would fall under a budget conversation? Yes, through contracting, yes. Yep. And I'd be happy to be involved in those conversations as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay, thank you. Great update. Thank you. Nice. Appreciate it. Next, we have uh, nutrition services. And I don't know if he's, oh, we are moving past that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, C. So um, I just have two quick items. Again, one probably will be more uh, in-depth conversation. So you will see in the board agenda, uh, there is a new policy for first reading. I'm gonna sort of flip. Um, it's actually second, but I'm gonna start with, with it. Uh, we have a new uh, first reading for policy DBDB under fiscal management. Uh, it's specific to fund balance. Uh, this is an update with minor changes to the policy based on discussions at the budget com committee hearings over the past two months. The district needs to shift the ending fund balance to 7% of the total adopted operating revenues in the general fund. And again, this is truly the fund if there's emergencies or to help cover unnecessary borrowing um, in order to meet cash flow needs should we have that type of issue and or reserve to meet unexpected emergencies and catastrophic events. So again, it was a discussion that we had during our, our meeting. So this is a first reading and, and then we will come back uh, to you next meeting with, with that to approve in the consent agenda. So again, topic that we've already sort of talked through. Is this, is this coming from uh, OSBA's updates or is this coming from our own discussions about where we should be with our ending fund. Correct, it's through where our discussions are with our ending funds and the amount of money that um, we do have in our general fund, because um, that has grown. In reviewing the budget, it was, I, I think we're a little over seven right now in the in the budget. And uh, and Cease mentioned that we've been aiming for seven. And so I think this is just an update to that. And then it's worth noting that's a, at least, so we can go above that mm -hmm. like we should. But seemed like it was a good time to get the policy closer to what we were actually doing. Uh, 
Okay, the second part, I just wanna update the board on where the district currently is in the hiring process of the principal position at Central High School. Uh, over the past few weeks, the district office has been meeting with department or has met with department chairs and classified leadership of the high school and a small group of representatives from the high school. I wanna remind the board that after our uh, special meeting uh, regarding the hiring process, we did take your feedback and uh, feedback from those two groups and are uh, moving forward and making changes to that, to that process. Last week, we had a meeting as has been shared tonight with the high school staff to gather input and communicate the revised hiring process. Um, as shared also tonight, that meeting was with the high school staff went in a different direction and we did not at that point gather input or review next steps during that time. Uh, we are at a point, the district is at a point uh, where decisions need to be made as we move forward. So a couple of things I wanna share with, with the board tonight. The district does have a pool of candidates that are ready to be screened in again. Uh, this is one option. We are hoping for participation from some of the high school staff, but haven't been able to reach that point at this time. There have also been conversations uh, this past week with the Coalition of Oregon School Administrators, otherwise referenced as COSA. It's, it's an organization we work with as we review options that may still be available as we think about next steps. Some of those options that we have talked about and are just looking at include uh, reviewing the current pool who has applied and moving forward with a new process. Uh, looking at an interim position for the high school principal for the 22-23 school year, or work with an outside firm to help us search for the next principal at Central High School. Now, the question has been asked if it's too late in the year to do this. And in our conversations with COSA, they, they have replied normally in these types of years. Absolutely, probably. But with uh, this unique year, they're still shifting and openings happening of high school principals, not only across the state and nationally. So with that, I'd just like to hear some input from the board on your thoughts as to the direction the district may go based on information shared this past week with board members. Um, I'd like a little clarity on, on when you said high school staff being a part of the process, which, which process are you talking about? So, we wanted to meet with them to talk through any additional qualification skills. Um, again, we believe we have most of those identified, um, but we need to, to really make sure that all of those, we would like them to be a part of the screening process. And then again, going into some different just processes similar to what we have done in the previous uh, searches. I will share, we have reached out to, um, again, after our meeting, to several different uh, human resources in different school districts and in leadership to just check our processes, uh, to really look at and identify if there are things that we need to change, shift, et cetera. Again, some of those we um, heard and we're going to move in that implementation. One example uh, would be that uh, do a professional learning for the staff, because again, we did not have the opportunity to do that at the, the last um, process. So with uh, with checking that, um, again, we've people are saying that we have a really strong process. Again, talk to us about maybe different order or different procedural things that we could look at uh, to make it stronger. If any staff is involved, would we in the screening process would would they be confidential? Would it be like like the stakeholder group? Um, all of the yeah, that's the be again. Should that's the hard to, to identify. Well, it, the committee consisted of a science teacher, a math teacher, and there are some things we probably could generally report out. Absolutely, I think if there are, if it gets too narrow, it can identify sure, certain. I know, if it said, you know, this was made up of six high school teachers and three middle school teacher, you know, that type of thing. I think that would be, I mean, for the people that really want to know who the stakeholder groups, who's doing part of the screening, I think we need to, to, uh, to get teachers involved in that process, um, specifically from the building, I would think. And I think that was mentioned by some of the speakers earlier today that they, that they would be influential, want to be influential in that decision. 
um, didn't get get that this time. So I would think moving forward, having that that voice would be pretty pretty powerful and inclusive. How likely is it that we would um, potentially before the end of the year get to a point of, you know, kind of trying to find a place to breathe at the high school and moving forward with this? I, I think Whichever that's what we're trying to continue to do um, in taking those steps forward. And um, I just, in my opinion, having staff and teachers go through this over the summer could be more detrimental than what's happening right now. Just that open-ended, uncertain, kind of empty gut feeling. I don't think we could get to a conclusion in four days. Again, that's why there are, there are multiple options I think we need to think about. Um, and then you mentioned something before and that made me look back on my notes of one of the speakers mentioned the words external restorative facilitator. Is that what you're talking about looking at? No. So this would be an outside firm that would do the entire search. Do like a headhunter pretty much. Uh, headhunter. It's, Thanks. it's in, in, again, they're specific in K-12 education. Okay. And when you say entire search, that means bringing us the pool of candidates to begin our process. Potentially. I, again, that would be, I would need to have some conversations with, with those people just to, clarify. just to clarify what that would look like. So I, I, I sat in the, the staff meeting and I sat on that call with, with COSA and with OSBA as well. Um, and I think it's, I, I, we didn't i don't think everything was done perfectly and we've had those those discussions and i think it's it's obvious from the response that we got as well that we can do things better um so that being said i i, I think we can two things can be true at the same time a process can work as it's intended to work but you can still have a big negative impact on people and and I that's what I heard from that group on on Wednesday, and that's what I heard tonight. And so I think that while we didn't go in there looking for that specific feedback, I think that we incorporate that into our processes going forward. And I think that that you are definitely mindful of those things going forward and how we can make the process better. Um, I I don't believe in this dichotomy that we that we have to to take an action or make a motion or anything like that. I don't, I don't, at least personally, I don't believe that that we're in that position where we're required to do. I think two things can be true at the same time. The process could can work as it's intended to work, and people are very upset about it. Um, so I, I agree with Darcy on the fact that I think we need to move forward. I would be in support of of hiring an outside firm to get the best pool of qualified candidates we can, the largest pool to select from, and begin that process so we can bring stability. And that, that was the under, one of the underlying threads I heard throughout that whole meeting. And then tonight was getting that stability. Um, and certainly that's a value. And I know you share that value, having the stability where the staff aren't having to go back to ground zero at the things that they have momentum in. And I know we'll incorporate that into the search to make sure that somebody's not coming in here looking to blow stuff up, that the, the progress that we have, because the buildings are an extension of the district. So a lot of, a lot of that progress uh, can be perhaps indirectly attributed to the, the, the district office's guidance on that. Um, so I, I wouldn't anticipate someone coming in here to be a world shaker and, and knocking people off balance and things like that. And so uh, someone where that makes people feel safe and um, to, to, to dissent if they want to. And I know that's a value that, that you share in the process as well. But I, I do think we need to get, get moving on that with those things in mind, learning the lessons that we learned from this time going forward. Um, and 
it, it does, in my mind, bring up bigger, deeper issues as well that I think we can talk about as a board, uh, perhaps an opportunity for some organizational development throughout the, throughout the district at the school level, as well as at the district office level. Everybody has blind spots. And oftentimes the best person to come in and identify those might be somebody from the outside. So I think that's a lengthy conversation that, that we as the board can have perhaps a, an individual that can come in and report to the board um, to identify those blind spots. That way we can work with the district office and getting that, getting that taken care of. But again, making this lengthy response even longer. Um, <laughs> let's get moving forward mm -hmm. uh, on this process so we can have that stability as best we can as soon as possible. With transparency yep. and... What, what <clears throat> kind of a time frame do you think we could get from an outside firm? I, again, I have... We, have, we don't know. I will... Do some following up. This will be my priority tomorrow. I can have probably some information and be able to share even out with you, I would say later in the day of what that might even look like, what that is, if there is a search firm, a couple search firms that have the ability to, to do that. Again, we're in a unique year. That's what's being conveyed. Again, I know Byron and Steve were part of that conversation and heard that of just some some different options for us to think through um so they, they us, gave me they they gave the board the me a couple leads on potential firms to to use uh to look at um advise that would, um, that, would that be something we'd have to go out for bid for or is that something you could just no normally those um those costs run between i'm going to say nine thousand and twelve thousand dollars again anything that's over fifty thousand would need to come to the board i don't think we're okay. we're talking about that so, so we can move quickly we, we could move that. quickly and and again i may be able to make a few phone calls tomorrow again based off of some information that i've received to see how quickly that could be and then could report back to the board even i would say late late tomorrow of where we might be with that I would like, if we can, personally, um, I don't know the last day for teachers at the high school. Technically, the last day of school is Tuesday, but staff are on up through mm -hmm. Friday. Um, some do swap out three days at the beginning yeah. of the year, so some will not will be gone as mm -hmm. of as of Thursday. I don't know if it's possible, but to give them something to be able at the end of the year to just be like, finish up a year and get us to ready for next year with hopefully every one of those teachers and staff in those buildings. I guess kind of back to um, the earlier comment about the restorative coordinator. I don't know if that's the right word, but it seems like and looking at the whole thing, the wound has been created. We can't undo that. And I think we should invest in helping that heal as, as best we can. Uh, and so I would certainly vote in favor of pursuing that as well. Absolutely. Uh, at mm -hmm. the same time. Yes. If I'll do some follow-up. Yeah. I'll do some follow-up with, yeah. with uh, the leadership at uh, the high school that is, is responsible for that. So long, I mean, you also have, you said you had some, some pool of candidates already. Uh, I would think that they would be also looked at by the whoever. whatever. Yeah, I, I, that's going to be part of our conversation of where does that tie in? You know, does that get absorbed in the process? Again, I, I don't have all those answers sure, yeah. right now, but I will, Keep that's one of the, the, one of the key questions I would ask of where does that, that pool stand um, in that process with, if, you know, if we end up going in that direction. Well, that's the direction I prefer to go in is the outside, outside hire to get the. I do too. Well, so long as they're able to keep transparency, I think 
that's key as well. You know, the last thing I want is an outside person to come in and keep even more stuff from the community. So they're able to be transparent, but have a larger net to cast. Okay, but I want to, I would like to know, as well as the community, I'm sure would like to know where we are in that in that process once we get those pools and then we continue that that clarity and transparency every step of the way. I know that there's there's a petition going around demanding that. Um, and I think you've you've heard that and said, okay, so this is what we need, this is the, the, the clarity we need, the transparency we need at this step and at this step and at this step. And assuming we follow that, then I think I mean, even without a petition, that's being met. And if we find whoever that firm, if that's the right way of describing it, um, it would be that we do our own checking into the, that group. Mm -hmm. Not just, not that it is just reading a pamphlet or a website, yeah. Yeah. but that You'll we do yeah we'll get we'll get recommend that's, that's one of the key questions i'll ask is who else from a recommendations point to allow us to be able to have those mm -hmm. conversations again i would say possibly regionally and then even again our neighbors either north or south of us um, and that's that's one of the benefits to 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 having an outside firm is their continued existence as a firm depends on bringing people quality candidates mm -hmm. and so but this um, was somebody that you said was recommended by COSA or OSBA. Yeah, one of the names. One of the was names recommended by COSA. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at as well. I think we need to move forward. I think we owe it to the high school to go find the very best possible candidate and person we can. I think that we need to work on some of the organizational culture and the wounds and things. I, I think that we also have to have a backup plan because we may find that we get down the road here two weeks and we don't have that candidate and we got to have a plan. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, th I, I, I think as the board, we, we went through the process with the superintendent and the HR director of HR to understand it. We went through our discussion with the OSBA to understand our role you know, we've been told multiple times it's not our role to make the personnel decisions or the administrative decisions, except for in a very extreme case where we would overrule and direct the superintendent to proceed with the hire. I don't think we're there, as hard as that is to hear. Um, but I don't, I don't think we're there. I think we have to commit to improving the process, providing the resources to get back on track and get the right person. And I think that using outside help to do that is the best shot. So I think that's where we're at. We have to move quickly. Yes, it'd be nice to let the staff know before they leave um, what, where we're at. Where we're at. Where we're at. Mm -hmm. And figure out a way to keep communications mm -hmm. open if we go yeah, into Yeah, that's one months. of the key questions I or just wrote down, communication yeah. plan in the process and what that looks like yeah. working with them. Being, being very mindful how hard decisions impact people. And that was, that was a big message that I got from that meeting was there was a lot of emotion in that meeting. Um, and, you know, we we might have a different view of, of the facts and a different perception on things, but again, two things can be true at the same time. We can, we can think that we made the right choice, but it's still gonna have a negative impact on some really important people, just being mindful of that, so. Yeah, let's let's move on. Okay, I appreciate the the input. That is it for for my report. All right. So moving on to the board report, uh, we touched on this earlier tonight. We have a PLC meeting on the twenty seventh of June. Although we may want to look at time different, so I'll work with you on that. To I, I just need a couple of weeks in advance notice. Yeah, if we're going to be meeting early. Full day. If we're going to meet in the morning, in the afternoon, like after lunch or something, right? Or which I need to know a couple weeks. Ago. It's a Monday. It's um, Monday the twenty seventh. So it's, it's the intent that that would be our retreat. 
one of them, yes, our our June retreat, and then the next one would be in August, which will like an all day thing. That would be the goal. If that date doesn't work, um, I'm looking at you. That, um, if if that date doesn't work on the 27th, we could look at a different date either later in that week or even. Uh, potentially the following week when you say all day like, I, I would say we're going like to need at least uh, six <laughs> I would say six so whether we did a 12 to six or if we wanted to do it in the morning either way um, and again we also have to get in our our budget budget hearing on the 27th sorry thank you C so at least we will have to do a budget hearing on the 27th so if the 27th works for a majority of the uh, board let's yeah let's 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 try to work with the 27th and add time to that okay. i don't know if we need to go the full if we, <laughs> i'm gonna have to call in so <laughs> yep. i don't know that i could do it noon to, like, like but, a two to eight would probably be better for me two to eight or yeah okay two to eight i could do okay i can't do that day you can't do that day at all. Mm -mm. I've got college. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we are, are there as a whole board. Um, yeah. So, so, so do that okay, Emily and I. Will, how about we'll we'll reach out and sort of uh, we'll do a doodle poll to see if we can maybe that yeah, week. Couldn't remember the name of that thing. But that week, see if we can find something that week. Okay. Okay, the other one the topic I wanted to just mention is uh, there is a complaint that I've been working on with Jeannie Scott, and I'm trying to get it to the point where it's actually specific risk complaints that we can actually respond through the complaint process. Can we say um, that in front of the whole community of people here? It's part of our complaint process. Okay, it I just complaint. it's been turned in as a formal okay. complaint. Yeah. It's just not in final form. I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I won't say the name again, but thank you for that question. So the reason I wanted to bring it up is because um, it's a little complicated because it came in as a combo kind of complaint. Um, I've already talked to Jennifer and our attorney about it, as well as OSBA to get it to the point where I try to break it down into the individual complaints. And most likely the next step is to take, now what I have is the individual complaints and run that through Brian Hungerford. Um, everybody go and double check your complaint process though, K-L-A-R, mm -hmm. uh, to look at the timeframes and exactly what happens if it's a complaint against the board or a complaint against the superintendent, it does vary a little bit. Um, but I will keep you posted when I hear back from Brian. There's the possibility of doing public hearings, but that you get into that when you have a viable complaint and you really need additional input. Um, so I'm not quite, I'm not there yet. I need to defer to Brian and his feedback on, on that, and as well as probably talk to the vice chair. So I just wanted you to know that I'm taking that seriously and doing my best to try to work through that quickly. Any questions about that? Okay, that brings us to our consent agenda. It's a standard consent agenda with the approval of minutes, personnel recommendations, finance report. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is it, is it every part of the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Or take them out of it? Um, well, in reading this, it says prior to voting on consent agenda, any board member may also request clarification about consent agenda items without moving them off the business section of the agenda. So I just want to touch on the personnel recommendations. If I'm able to, I... we we can do it a couple of ways. We can pull it off as a separate topic or we can talk about it as a part of discussing the motion. So we could do a motion and then have a discussion. Okay, I'd like to discuss it in a motion. I don't need to take it off. I just okay. think that... So I think I heard Don, you made the motion. Second. Peggy, you seconded. So now, but all it's time for discussion. Yeah, well, it, and it was brought up by one of the speakers in the beginning, um, just about the the hiring process on 
in ACES on how that, that came about. Um, I just don't, and, and I, and it didn't set well with me at first. And I think they're both fine candidates. I think they're, they're where they need to be, but um, bringing up, I think she brought up, it said that it wasn't posted. Um, I think that could be another lesson that, that we learn and that um, making it a formal post, a formal position, uh, it would be in our best interest to, to be inclusive and to be equitable, to have done something like that rather than um, just find positions for them. And and again, it's nothing against the the, the no I, the I policy. It gives me the both. ability to do that. So again, but I hear you right. and and continue to take feedback and reflect on those pieces as we move forward. Sure. Thank you, Vidal. Good feedback. Any other comments? All in favor of passing the consent agenda, please raise your right hand. So wait a second. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So I have four all against. So motion passes four to two. Uh, that brings us to our business agenda. So first up is the superintendent evaluation. I am going to read into the record this evening, the superintendent evaluation for the 21-22 school year. This is as a result of feedback consolidated by the board, by myself, and an executive meeting we had earlier tonight. The Board of Directors of the Central School District 13J has completed the annual evaluation of Superintendent Cabesta for the 21-22 school year. All seven board members have served on the board for at least one full year and have been able to observe and be a part of the successes achieved this year. The evaluation focused on OSBA's recommended eight professional superintendent standards and actual progress against superintendent and district goals. Regarding the eight professional standards, we determined that Superintendent Cabista's performance was well above standard in the areas of inclusive district culture, visionary district leadership, ethics and professional norms, effective financial management, and culturally responsive instruction leadership and improvement. In the areas of policy governance, advocacy, effective organization management, and communication and community relations, the board felt the superintendent's performance was adequate but would like to see continued growth and development in these areas. The board determined that Superintendent Cabista has done an outstanding job of leading the district through the COVID pandemic while remaining focused on student achievement and increasing focus on caring for the whole child. As an example, 13J was one of the first districts to identify and plan for summer school as a key measure for helping students make up for lost learning, which occurred during the required distance learning program. The focus on social emotional learning in concert with a focus on literacy while implementing consistent assessment tools has been key to regaining student learning momentum. It will be critical to maintain this focus in order to close learning gaps and take full advantage of additional funding that has been provided through ESSER. Currently, the district is facing uh, community and staff backlash regarding the high school principal hiring process, which indicates that more work and leadership in the area of effective communication and organization culture is required. The board would also, would, the board would like to see additional avenues of communication established to be better informed in particular with any potential controversial topics. The board does wish to recognize the extraordinary effort that Superintendent Cabista put forth during the pandemic to connect across a variety of community and governmental partners, including Department of Education, uh, our local cities, Polk County Health and Human Services, Polk County Fire, and the surrounding school districts. Superintendent Cabista engaged in a first ever collaboration with the two cities and the public safety community to generate a collective response to the pandemic, resulting in a leadership and innovation award from the Mid Willamette Valley Council of Governments. These partnerships were key to the planning and response of Central 13J and have led to a stronger network across these organizations, which will be helpful moving forward. Regarding leadership development, the board recommends that Superintendent Cabista continue to work on executive communication with emphasis on being concise, particularly when responding to difficult questions and reduce the use of filler statements and words. 
The board will be working with Superintendent Cabista over the next several weeks to develop board, district, and superintendent goals for the 22-23 uh, uh, school year, aligned with uh, and in support of our 13J strategic plan. We look forward to partnering with Superintendent Cabista as we continue to focus on 13, Central 13J's long-term focus areas of student growth and achievement, family involvement, community partnership, and staff leadership and continuous improvement. And that is the evaluation for the past year. Do any board members want to add comments? Thank you for putting that together. And it's great to have all the board members represented in that um, in that report. It doesn't always happen. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for putting it together. Yeah, you're welcome, Peggy. And thank you again to the Superintendent Evaluation Committee, made up of Darcy, Don, and, and Jan for the work that they did to help uh, review the process. Okay. That brings us to election of officers for the upcoming year. So these are the board officers. We would normally do this in the July meeting, but I'm going to be out of town in July. Um, not that I have to be there, but I thought it'd be best if we could pull it up. And in years where we're not changing out board members, you can do this, pull it up a month. That way next month we're hitting the ground running with the new chair and new vice chair. So the floor is open for nominations for school board chair for the 22-23 school year. I'd like to nominate Don Wall for um, chair. Thank you, pa Peggy. Don, would you accept that nomination? I would. So moved. Do we have any other? Um, nominees. I would like to nominate Byron Schenkel for vice chair. Thank you, Darcy. Byron, would you accept the vice chair if so moved? Sure. Do we have any other nominees? Uh, I would vote for Darcy for another um, another year of vice chair. Darcy, would you accept that nomination if so voted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other nominations? Okay, so for the chair for next year, um, the nomination is for Don Wall. All in favor of that nomination, please raise your right hand. Congratulations, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, in the matter of the vice chair then, let's see, how do we do this? Last year we did it by out. paper. We could we could do it that way. I've got, uh, I believe. Notes. Yeah, let's do sti and sticky notes. I do have sticky uh, notes. Season. So we have two nominations. Two nominations for vice chair Byron and Darcy. If you want to collect them, hold them and I will give them to Cease. Since you use my pen, you can't tell who voted for who. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's my 15. Oh, wait, you didn't want to hold it? Okay. That's a rare thing. <laughs> so just to clarify, my term will start with the next meeting, so you can finish this meeting. Correct. Well, it started now. Without <laughs> complaints. Uh, chair Love, the vote is uh, Byron Schinkel as the vice chair on a vote of five. All right. Thank you, Cease. Congratulations, Byron. And Darcy, for, thank you for being willing to, to be mm -hmm. vice chair again. And we'll continue to look for opportunities to have you involved in that capacity. 
Next up on our business agenda is out of state travel requests. And I'm just looking because I do not believe uh, Miss Love is here. So I just wanted to make sure because uh, so we have two out of state travels. Uh, the first one in your board packet this evening is information about an overnight out of state uh, field trip request for future business leaders of America and a trip to Chicago, Illinois at the end of June. Uh, this trip is for three central high school students who finish at the top in the top three of at state and earned a spot to the FBLA National Convention. This trip funding has been covered through the Monmouth Independence Community Foundation Verna Duncan grant. Um, so I'm going to ask for the board to move forward in approving the FBLA National Convention trip from June 28th through July 3rd of 2022. We have a motion. I move to approve the out of state travel for your love. FBLA National Finance finalists and for FFA to travel to the national conference. We're going to do them together. We can do them together if you want me to. I can read this. Okay. We'll also, together. in your packet is uh, an overnight out of state field trip request for Future Farmers oh, of America. Okay. Nope, right. you're okay. And a trip to Indianapolis, Indiana in October of 2022. This trip is the 2022 National Conven Convention for up to 10 high school students, and students are currently fundraising for this trip. Again, I also asked the board to move forward with the this out of state to. trip. <laughs> I second. But, thank you, Darcy. Uh, any questions about those out of state trips? Exciting to have kids going. Yeah. All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes six to nothing. And that brings us to our 22, 23 school year calendar draft. Yeah, so in the board packet is also a, a, a draft two year calendar, which is very exciting. This is uh, in working with both associations, they have uh, wanted to move forward with this. So again, these are draft calendars for both the 22, 23 school year and the 23, 24 school year. Uh, the, I wanna be clear, the district is still in negotiations with both unions, but would like to move forward with the approval of the draft calendar knowing there may be a few slight adjustments. And then again, we would come back to the board with those changes and additional adoption. Uh, feedback has been gathered throughout the spring from administration, leadership at the school buildings, district office, as well as union leadership. I asked the board to move forward with approving the draft calendars for the 22-23 and the 23-24 school years. Is there any, without reading every date on here, is there any significant change? No, we're looking at a couple different holidays, so that may be incorporated. That would affect the end of the school year and when we start. Uh, so that's probably the most significant uh, shift at the end of the school year. This is a draft, though. This yeah. says draft on it. Correct. So after negotiations, correct. Could be there could be some slight changes, so we would want to come sure. back, but it, we feel we're uh, far enough along, and we would like to get this up on the on the school website for families to be able to see. Can I get a maybe just make a suggestion on this calendar because I get I get a lot of text messages or phone calls uh, from parents trying to read it um, just on on could be self-explanatory to some if something's green there's never anything that's green over here that's okay. what it is so cut the color coat the color legend. coat the, the, the letters the on there yeah. or yep. the, the letters yep. the, the, there is typically a legend towards. The black, the orange, the gray, the yeah. green, we, the pink, the yellow. Yep, we will we will do that before we be, post it. That would be so awesome. Okay. And then maybe throughout the year, if I hate to say this graduation changed three or four times. That was really difficult on a lot of people, I think, planning family in and out of town. It's just really yes. hard. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the 23, 24, and 20? 22, 23. 22, 23, 23, 24 district calendar. I, oh, sorry. I so move to approve the calendar with the color quoted, making sense. Thank you, all. <laughs> to everybody. Is there a second? To me, especially. Second. Thank you, Byron. Any other questions about the calendar? All in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. And then the next the up, I am bringing, joining us to share about student fees as well as student nutrition fees. I'm gonna just sort of do them both, but we're gonna do them 
and separate is uh, district's finance and operations manager and director C. Scoots. Thank you. Um, and I did want to give one shout out. Uh, the FBLA uh, applied for a grant from the Monmouth Independence Community Foundation's Verna Duncan sent um, Ambassadors of Excellence Award. And that is a new grant that was founded when Verna Duncan passed away. And it, it is designed specifically for students who are recognized in some kind of competition and need to travel and to really represent our community, um, but don't have months to fundraise because <laughs> they don't know. Um, and the Monmouth Independence Community Foundation is funding up to $2,200 in travel costs for each of those three students cool. so that that they are able to attend. Uh, and we're really, really excited about that and that inaugural award from that uh, fund. So this since we my fifth grade teacher. not only lost Verna, um, but have lost Don Duncan uh, recently, uh, it's it's their legacy. This is a great, great honor to be able to give this award. Um, so, and I thanked the family on behalf of the school district at Don's memorial service last two weeks ago. So, um, no. student fee. Um, in your packet is a uh, document that shows the student fee schedule that is currently in effect. Uh, with suggested changes. The um, current, historically, the district has charged a minimal fee, sort of between $10 and $25 for certain classes at Central and occasionally at Talmadge that require extra supplies and materials and that generally result in products the students can take home for personal use. Um, in reviewing state guidelines, some of these fees may be in conflict with that. Um, and we also know that those fees can pose a barrier. In all cases, the district has a process to waive those fees uh, for students who are on free and reduced lunch, but also students who apply for scholarship or hardship on those. Um, but often, as we know, people don't think to ask for that or don't want to ask for that help. So this, this year, the staff is recommending that we rescind those course fees and some optional fees. The optional fees, for example, the band instrument rental. Um, there is a state formula for being able to charge a band instrument rental fee. Um, and we don't have, we, we've just never had the capacity to fully do the assessment that's required of that. It basically would be a pass through if we rented instruments to rent to students, but we don't do that. We have some instruments on hand um, and we have been repairing those and maintaining those out of the general fund anyway. So that is the recommendation. Um, and then other fees for athletics, club activities, um, and certain other fees and extracurricular things would remain under this with available scholarships and waivers. So, I want to say thank you because student fees have been a burr on my side for the past four years. <laughs> and if I can make the motion, I would love to. <laughs> I move to waive the fee charge for students for getting individual. Wait, wait, no, that's nutrition. Sorry. Yep. I move. I move to adopt the proposed 22-23 student fee schedule. Thank you, Peggy. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second the motion, but then I have a question. Yes, uh, I have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions or topics for discussion? So this is as proposed, and I'm confused looking at this chart. So are the are the yellow things going away? Yes, staff recommends the board rescind course fees and some optional fees as highlighted in yellow on the attached schedule. That's okay. I didn't make that very clear. Somehow I missed that. Okay. 
Good question. Yep. Okay. Any other questions about the fee schedule? All in favor of approving the fee schedule, please raise your right hand. That passes unanimously. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the very first time we did this, it's like, can we get rid of them? And we've been looking at that. So. Uh, also, some of our fellow districts, for example, have made those court paid for those course materials out of the student investment account, for example. So um, that would that is an option for funding those in the future. But but it's really we it's very doable budget wise. Um, thank you very much. Our second um, request is from student nutrition, and I I just want to. Uh, give you an update. We mentioned here that during the uh, pandemic related waivers, federal subsidies for child nutrition that we have had for two years, uh, those are going away. But the district will be operating under the community el eligibility profession, um, program. And under that program, all meals at eligible schools be free to all students. The last time we spoke, I um, mentioned to you, we had four eligible schools. The high school, we had applied to have them review that. And this morning, we were awarded a the community eligibility provision at all schools. So we will have free meals at all schools next year. But that program does not include students who bring meals from home but want milk. So um, rather than have a fee just for milk for students who bring their meals from home, I might side comment about agricultural subsidies in this country, um, the uh, food service director and I would like to ask that that milk fee be waived. Uh, we don't have to return our cashiers to the buildings who took care of that. We don't have the cash handling issues just for milk. And there is one correction I have to make in your report. Um, it said the estimated revenue for milk sales is $2,000. So we would be foregoing that. That is a misstatement. That's the cost of milk. Revenue was $3,500. So that margin really is only about $1,500 in a typical year. And that's what we would be foregoing by waiving the milk with individual purchase fee. Thank you, Cease. Uh, do I have a motion to, well, as presented in your board package? I'll do that one too. I move to waive the fee charge for students for getting individual milk only um, at mealtime. Thank you, Peggy. Second. Thank you, Vidal. Any other questions? All in favor of approving the motion to waive milk fee, please raise your right hand. And that motion passes. Okay. That brings us to our wrap up items. Do we have any comments from individual board members? I would, Steve, I'd just like to thank you for your service over this past year as chair and uh, <clears throat> working with Don and just really appreciate all the extra time and, and, uh, yeah, effort and and uh, stress that causes in your life, I'm sure. So, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say the same to, to both you and to Darcy. So, yeah, for taking that, taking that time. I want to thank everybody else for not nominating me for any of those. <laughs> not yet. Yeah, yeah, I'm not ready for that quite yet. So, thank you. Thank you to everybody. And I want to thank the folks that stuck around for such a for such a long meeting, and for all the speakers that came in and, and shared. Um, I think uh, probably what Darcy and Byron experienced at the the school meeting. Um, I was very moved by a lot of the a lot of the speeches, and and I am looking forward to moving forward with the with the staff involved in. In the, the future uh, selection, in, in some factor. 
Thank you, Rudolph. I, I do have a comment prepared for tonight, both for my colleagues here and the, the folks that stuck around. Hope others can hear this as well. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board and the superintendent for your support over the past three years as I've served as board chair. And I also wanna thank Darcy for her service as vice chair and the many conversations we've had over the past year about leadership and boardsmanship. I think we've both grown as a result of those conversations and through our willingness to listen and learn from each other. Thank so you. thank you, Darcy. I'd also like to share with the entire district that I'm disheartened by the current situation at the high school. It seems all too familiar to me. As with most organizational conflict, there are a number of contributing factors and a variety of points of view. There is also a tendency to create adversaries and apply pressure as a means to resolve conflict. We need, we, we tend to make assumptions and jump to conclusions about each other as we search for answers. And often this can lead to finger pointing and in general environment where we don't take the time to appreciate one another's point of view and what we can each contribute to moving forward. Making decisions as a result of pressure tactics rarely if ever ends well. As a reminder, and this may be hard to see in this moment, everyone that has an interest in this situation is involved in one shape or another because we care about our community and our future generations. There is common ground to be found. I do believe that developing staff and promoting from within an organization is good for the overall culture and well being of an organization. It's best done with an intentional effort of mentoring and performing in different roles and stretch assignments. Passing over an internal candidate must be handled with digni dignity and careful consideration. There are some things that can be learned from what has occurred over the past two months. And I know that our superintendent is committed to making those changes. So we need to move forward and find some steps, several of which we touched on tonight, that will allow us to listen, learn, adjust, and work together as a team. That is the example that I hope we can set for our students. So some of those things were consistent with some of the comments tonight. And I do wanna thank everybody that was able, came and spoke and is sticking sticking with us here tonight. I know it's not easy. Um, it's a really uncomfortable situation as well for us to try to figure out how to navigate. We are here and we are moving forward with the principal search. So we'll do our best to help guide that and learn from this as we move forward. And again, thank you for everything that you do and thank you to the board and we will find a way. So with that, uh, we are going into executive session, our meeting, our, our night's not over yet. Under the provision of ORS 192.660 open meeting law, the board of directors will enter executive session for the following purpose, to conduct deliberations with persons you have designated to carry on labor negotiations. We are adjourned and uh, 